Good evening and welcome to the debate. This is a very historical moment. Our crowd is not great, but it is significant. And there will be recordings made thereof. Each one of the, the speakers who I'll introduce momentarily has um, copyright privileges to do whatever they wish um, with the, the transcription, the faithful representation of the transcription of, of the debate in all of those forms. My name is Danny Ditson. I'm from Fredericksburg, Texas. Background basically is I'm a Master of Arts in Bible and Related Studies from Abilene Christian University, but I'm presently teaching eighth grade English, which is harder than anything I ever did in working on my master's degree. There are some people that I need to thank. Mark Dockery is over there um, conducting the, the digital recording. Video recording has been done by Carol Jones. Um, and of course, our two speakers who are here at their own expense, Dr. Fred Sanders, the bio law, I'll say more about him in a moment, and uh, Professor Anthony Buzzard from Atlanta Bible College. The first speaker tonight will be Professor Anthony Buzzard. Actually, he is Sir Anthony Buzzard, born in Surrey, England, and educated at Oxford University and later at Bethany Theological Seminary in Chicago. He holds master's degrees in languages and theology from Oxford. He came to the United States with his wife and daughters in 1981 and has taught Bible at Atlanta Bible College. Anthony has traveled widely, including visits to Malawi, for purposes of evangelism. He's written two full-length books. The one most relevant to tonight's discussion is the title with that engaging and inviting title, The Doctrine of the Trinity, Christianity's Self-Inflicted Wound. And then another book, Our Fathers Who Aren't in Heaven, The Forgotten Christianity of Jesus the Jew. In 1996, he was a nominee for the Templeton Prize for Progress in Religion. He is co-editor of a journal from the Radical Reformation published by Atlanta Bible College Church of God General Conference. The second speaker is Dr. Fred Sanders. He is an evangelical thinker with a passion for the grand tradition of Christian doctrine. He is a tutor at Tory Honors Institute at Biola. In his work, he combines art, faith, and intellect to create unique learning resources. As a matter of fact, Dr. Sanders has just published with Air Varsity Press four volumes called the Dr. Doctrine's Christian Comics. Fred and his wife, Susan, are proud parents of three-year-old Freddie and one-year-old Phoebe. He says, other than being a parent and writing theological comic books, I'm just a normal theologian, he says. Um, he received his PhD from Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. This discussion about the nature of God and the nature of, of the Father and the nature of the Son um, and how they all interweave or don't is not a new topic. While there are currently lots of books being written on this, there are not a lot of face-to-face -face debates and discussions on the subject, so you're getting to experience something that is somewhat unique. Professor Buzzard will be discussing the, the affirmation the one God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of Jesus, and of the Scripture is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Professor Buzzard. Good evening. I speak English with a British accent, so if you listen carefully, you probably follow most of what I say. But if I say to you that I'm mad about my flat, I probably won't be saying that, actually. But as an example, you have to translate that into your language. I just said that I was excited about my apartment, and you heard that as angry about my flat tire. But apart from those communication difficulties, we'll, we'll have no, I think, no problem in communicating. I feel very honored to be here in California. I've been living in the States for 20 years now. My impression is that nobody preaches sermons on the Trinity, or very, very seldom. There are Bible answer people who take this issue very seriously, but nobody really quite knows what the Trinity is, and so I'm going to hope to listen carefully as my Dr. Sanders defines exactly what he means by the Trinity. But let me start by simply making this comment to you. This is a very uh, momentous subject because there are a billion Muslims on the earth who are offended at the notion that God is three in one. And there are many millions of Jews who are equally troubled and puzzled by the notion that Jesus is God, as it's known for. So this is no small deal. If it would turn out 
after your patient examination of this subject over a period of time, and nobody changes their mind overnight, by the way, on these great things, but taking this as a start, if it should turn out that God, in fact, is one single person, and the Messiah, Jesus, is the Son of God, supernaturally conceived in the womb of his mother, if that should be the case, immediately the Muslims and the Jews would be attracted to our Christian faith in a greater way. So these are not small issues. Secondly, of course, you know that people have died for this argument, these various arguments. I remind you that John Calvin orchestrated the murder of Michael Servetus on the issue of the Trinity. It's a story that happened in 1553, I think, today. So people shed blood. It was true that in England you were generally uh, put to death up till about 1600 and something if you dared to say that God was other than the triune God. Happily, in these wonderful days of freedom and in America where you can say more or less anything, get away with it, uh, we can have this sort of debate in a friendly manner. And I'm sure that we're all going to learn from what is said and also from the questions that are asked here. Here's my basic premise. I start from a Church of England basis. Originally, I just wanted to add, though, to tell you that I'm not a Bible expert from this high at all. I knew nothing about Scripture until I was 20, was given a Bible, and I've never been the same since. I'm still reading from what I'm reading there. So I'm not one that was trained to know anything about the Trinity or the non-Trinity. I get the impression that most of us, and probably Dr. Sanders, uh, to some extent, are Unitarians. What I mean by that is this, that we generally talk about God and praying to God through Jesus. I don't hear people praying to the Trinity. John Calvin, who's a Trinitarian, said, I don't like that prayer about, oh, divine Trinity. So most people are perhaps partly Unitarians in varying degrees. Churches pray to God through Jesus. They don't pray to the Trinity. They don't address God as Trinity, mostly. Secondly, when they do pray, they're not doing it from some theologically worked out basis because they mostly don't know what the Trinity is. Most people, when told, as the Athanasian Creed says, that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, are thinking of three gods. Because never in your life did you ever say, that's a book, that's a book, that's a book, but it's one book. You don't say that kind of thing, and so it conveys no recognizable meaning to your mind. But what has happened is that you're told that you've got to say Jesus is God, to be orthodox, but often people don't really know what that entails. So perhaps in the course of these discussions we can examine these various slogans that are uttered and find out what really we are trying to say, and correct each other and modify our positions as we hear better arguments, because we're all Bereans, searching the scriptures daily to see if what we're hearing is true. And that's the only way to make any progress. And while we're doing that exercise, we're not killing each other these days, which is wonderful. We've really advanced in that respect. Here's my basic premise. I start from a Church of England basis. Originally, I just wanted to add, though, to tell you that I'm not a Bible expert from this high at all. I knew nothing about scripture until I was 20, was given a Bible, and I've never been the same since. I'm still reading from what I'm reading there. So I'm not one that was trained to know anything about the Trinity or the non-Trinity. I get the impression that most of us, and probably Dr. Sanders, uh, to some extent, are Unitarians. What I mean by that is this, that we generally talk about God and praying to God through Jesus. I don't hear people praying to the Trinity. John Calvin, who's a Trinitarian, said, I don't like that prayer about, oh, divine Trinity. So most people are perhaps partly Unitarians in varying degrees. Churches pray to God through Jesus. They don't pray to the Trinity. They don't address God as Trinity, mostly. Secondly, when they do pray, they're not doing it from some theologically worked out basis because they mostly don't know what the Trinity is. Most people, when told, as the Athanasian Creed says, that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, are thinking of three gods. Because never in your life did you ever say, that's a book, that's a book, that's a book, but it's one book. You don't say that kind of thing, so it conveys no recognizable meaning to your mind. But what has happened is that you're told that you've got to say Jesus is God, to be orthodox. But often, people don't really know what that entails. So perhaps in the course of these discussions, we can examine these various slogans that are uttered and find out what really we are trying to say and correct each other and modify our positions as we hear better arguments, because we're all Bereans searching the scriptures daily to see if what we're hearing is true. 
And that's the only way to make any progress. And while we're doing that exercise, we're not killing each other these days, which is wonderful. We've really advanced in that respect. So, if you look at the Bible, pick it up, take the whole Bible, 75% of your Bible is the Hebrew Bible, as you know, 75% of it, the Old Testament, which cannot be ignored. I think you get the impression that God is a single person. I've probably said the word I a couple of times, several times, and you really didn't need an army of theologians to tell you that when I use the singular pronoun, I, I mean that I'm one individual. I suggest to you that in the Bible that is true to the tune of about 15,000 times. In the Old Testament, I'm not going to recite all the verses, I'm not going to tell you where the verses are, but I'll recite, recite them and uh, refer to them in this sense. But you know that God says, I, I am he, there's none beside me. I'm the only one. Nobody created the world except me. I was alone when I did it, Isaiah 44, 24. A very eye-opening text, Isaiah 44, 24. The heavens and the earth were thrown into existence by myself. Nobody was with me, and so on. You know the Shema of Israel, the famous Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, which says that uh, invites Israel to listen, to pay attention, that the Lord our God is one Lord. And most of you, when you hear one Lord, you don't think of three Lords. Most of you, when you hear the singular pronoun over and over again, you don't immediately say that means three persons. So one of the bottom line arguments of Unitarianism has been that the natural meaning of the Old Testament and the New, when taken at its simplest level, produces the idea that God is a single person on the basis of those singular pronouns. You're dealing with a very difficult uh, issue when you begin to deviate, I think, from that rather simple basic truth. You seem to be dealing with putting three billiard balls on one spot. But reading the Old Testament, you don't get any idea at all that that's a problem. It doesn't seem to be difficult. What you do have is the promise of the Messiah. From the very start, you have this Son of God, uh, originally, of course, the seed, that's going to be coming in the future. It doesn't say that that seed is already there, because it's the seed of the woman. And so your mind is carried forward in the story. You're not thinking there of that seed being already in existence, I would think. And then you hear in 2 Samuel 7 of the son, who is going to be the son of the father, and the future tense, I will be his father, and he will be my son. Again, you don't get the impression from those texts that the son already exists. So the Jews then, who never believed in the Trinity, and their theology is Unitarian, Many good Hebrew scholars would say that the Old Testament, at least, is a Unitarian book par excellence, simply laced with Unitarianism rather than Trinitarianism. Most of those Jews were looking forward to a Messiah who would be a human person, of course. A dramatically divine person, if you like, an extraordinary person, with all of these divine qualities of the Spirit, but nevertheless a member of the human race. The whole point of the Messiah from their, point, from their angle was that he would be a member of the human race, not God becoming a man, that would be strange. So at that basic level then, as an observer of words and language, I simply cannot see how one can deviate from the singularity, the individuality of God, which of course not only, um, not only appeared to uh, Jews to be such, no Jew or very few Jews can be persuaded otherwise, some can, generally they're not. But any ordinary reader, I think a child of ten picking up the Hebrew Bible, would find that God is a single individual. I want to make one other point. How's my time now? Six minutes, okay, six minutes. The current situation in theology is very interesting in this sense, that I think that a great number of standard authorities, great names in the theological world, are really Unitarians. Now, they may be part of Trinitarian camps, but they sound to me as though they're arguing as Unitarians. That becomes very interesting. They seem to be being compelled by the Unitarian argument that it's easy to think of the Father as the sole and only God, and of Jesus as the Son of God, and not God the Son. There's a huge difference. So I'm going to be throwing out to you a few quotations. Obviously, this is such a vast subject, we have limited time, but I want to just leave you to in your minds, uh, contemplating some of these remarks. For example, Colin Brown, professor of theology at uh, Fuller, says the following, to be the son of God in the Bible means you are not God. To be the son of God in the Bible means you are not 
God. I think that's a very interesting statement. I think it's true. And you can examine that expression, Son of God, in the Old Testament and see what you think. But that's a significant statement. It sounds very Unitarian to me. So he doesn't know anything about God the Son, at least on that statement. Secondly, he says the following. To read John 1, in the beginning was the Word, as though it said, in the beginning was the Son, is patently wrong. Those quotes are from a, a learned journal article you, you could inquire at the end if you want to find out where that's from and read it. But those two statements give me then the sense that a lot of scholars are moving in a Unitarian direction, namely the notion that God is a single person. But if we look back over the last 500 years, we find the same thing being said by learned Trinitarians. Many of them said, in trying to explain the so-called Trinitarian verses, many learned Trinitarians agreed that they really were better explained on a Unitarian basis. So let me tackle this issue then of the meaning of the Trinity. Here's what learned Trinitarians said in regard to their own doctrine of the Trinity quite often. For, for example, Professor Stewart, who was known as a, a, a very prominent exegete in the 1800s, he says this, I do not and cannot understand the meaning of the word person in the proposition three persons in one God. I do not and cannot understand this idea of the word person. I don't know what it means. And therefore I cannot really consent to it and I can't defend the idea of three persons in one God, because I don't know what the word person means there. And until I do understand what it signifies, I have no hesitation in saying that my mind is absolutely unable to elicit any distinct and certain ideas from any of the definitions of the word person I've ever come across. Now he's speaking as a Trinitarian here. So we want to be clear then that we're saying something meaningful when we say three persons in one God. So my proposition to you is that that's not possible on the Biblical language. If you stay with the Biblical language, you're going to find God as a single person, over and over and over again. And you're going to find, if you look at the creedal statements in the Bible, and that's a good place to start. You don't start by pulling one isolated text from a passage that's not dealing expressly with the question in mind, namely, who is God? Is he one or two or three? You start with those creedal statements in the Bible. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. To us Christians, Paul said, there is one God, the Father. He never said there's one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he went on to say, not only is there one God, the Father, but there's one mediator between that one God. I added the word Father there, let me take that back, I misquoted. There's one God, and there's one mediator between that God, that one God, and man. The Messiah, the man, sorry, Messiah Jesus, right? I added the word Father, because I think it's implied, but I, I shouldn't do that. I didn't mean to misquote that. Let me read it again. Let me quote it again. There is one God, and one mediator between that, one God and man. The man, Mashiach, Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus. That's rather clear to me. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, where Paul is saying, how many gods are there in the world? We know that in pagan religions there are lots of gods and lords, but to us Christians now, there's only one God, the Father. And of course he goes on to say there's one Lord, Messiah. But he didn't say that Messiah was God, he said there's one God, come on the Father. In fact he said we know there's no God but one, there's only one God, the Father. Which put together, if you, if you compact those two sentences together, you have there's no God but the one God, the Father. In John 17, 3, Jesus said, Praying to the Father, you Father, addressing the one God of the universe, you Father are the only one who is truly God. O monos alithinos theos, I'm using my modern Greek pronunciation, I'm not mispronouncing these Greek words. But you Father are the only one who is truly God. Those to my understanding, and I may be wrong, I'm, I'm waiting to be corrected if necessary, those speak of a unitary monotheism, which I really can't argue with. So that's my basic proposition. Well, I want to confess to being at a disadvantage, and it's a disadvantage that Danny's already drawn attention to, that he and I have southern accents, and uh, Professor Buzzard has a rolling stentorian British cadences, which I envy him. Uh, a, a British person can say, honey, hand me the remote wrestling on, and it just sounds brilliant. Honey, you know, hand me the remote wrestling on. Uh, a southern man can say, E equals MC squared, and somehow make it sound hillbilly. So if you hear a little bit of that in me, right? Hey, y'all, E equals MC squared. I apologize. Um, 
I am dedicated to the doctrine of the Trinity because I believe Jesus is God. Um, and from my position as a Trinitarian, I can look around me and say, oh, there are many ways to do this doctrine wrong. There are many ways to misunderstand part of it, to overemphasize or underemphasize parts of the whole counsel of the Word of God, to read the Bible with one eye and only see texts which indicate the humanity of Christ and completely miss all the texts which indicate the divinity of Christ. Uh, a wise man has said that there are many angles at which to fall and only one angle at which to stand. I believe I occupy the angle at which you stand as a Christian, the Trinitarian position. Now, I look around from this position and say, there are many kinds of Unitarians in the world. Um, most Unitarians that I've dealt with or have read from fall into one or two camps. Um, one camp would be just a hard rationalist position, which finds a way of explaining away scripture in general and then doesn't have to deal with it. Um, if they find the revelation of the Gospel of John too hard to deal with as non-Trinitarians, they just say, well, it's a late edition, we don't have to believe in it, not the Word of God anyway, let's just worship God. That's one Unitarian position, kind of a rationalist Unitarianism. Um, but the other position among people who uh, claim to be Bible believers and try to read the Bible right, um, you can find a lot of Unitarians of the second person of the Trinity, by which I mean... Um, Christian, uh, people who are trying to be Christians who are so convinced that Jesus is God that they think, well, he's just God, God. That's all there is to it. We pray directly to him. We say, you know, when I, even when I pray our Father who art in heaven, I'm thinking about Jesus in my mind. And, and if I ever stop and ask myself the question, who did Jesus pray to? My circuits fry because for some reason, I only think that Jesus is God. That's a form of Unitarianism of the second position. From my Trinitarian, of the second person, from my Trinitarian position, I can look at that and say, oh yeah, that's one of the angles at which you fall. That hard rationalist position is one of the angles at which you fall. I have rarely read or interacted with um, the kind of anti-Trinitarianism I'm, I'm dealing with there with Professor Buzzard, which is a kind of biblicist committed to the Bible. When he finds a hard verse, he doesn't say, well, this is a later development. Um, he actually finds a way to try to explain it, I think wrongly. Um, but he's actually, and this is a good word in my vocabulary, biblicist, committed to interpreting what the Bible says. And yet he is a non-Trinitarian of the Socinian type. So someone who says, I'm a Unitarian of the first person, only God the Father is God. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is not God. So it's an interesting kind of Unitarianism that I haven't dealt with that much. Professor Buzzard mentions the... Uh, the Islamic critique of Christianity. The Muslims have an interesting word for Christians. Um, they refer to Christians as associators. Associators. Those who take the one God and then associate someone else with him. So that's the reason for rejecting Christianity is, well, okay, fine, you've got the one God, but then you add someone to him. You're associated. That's an interesting objection to Christianity. Uh, how do you respond to it? One way to respond is to say, well, yeah, that's right, we associate Jesus with God. I think the proper response is to say, Jesus Christ is associated with God, so much so that God is Jesus Christ. God is revealed in Jesus Christ. And if you're dealing with any other God, then you're dealing with a, an abstract God concept that you got from somewhere else. We see the glory of God shining forth in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the revelation of God. This is the word of God. When God reveals himself, what we see is Jesus Christ. As Jesus said to his disciples, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. He also said, I and the Father are one, which I always think of as kind of an interesting riff on Jesus's good Jewish commitments to the Deuteronomy text, the Shema, the, the creed of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. Jesus didn't come along and say, you know what, Judaism, that was a bad idea, that whole oneness of God thing. I disagree. Turns out I'm God too, so there's two of us. Okay. No, Jesus comes along as a good Jew and says, that's right, the Lord your God is one God. And what kind of unity is that? Well, I'll tell you what, I and the Father are one. It's a redefinition of the unity of God. Now, who is uh, entitled to pull off a redefinition of the unity of God? I think only God would be. Um, now, I really also appreciate Professor Buzzard's um, interest in the Old Testament and a really sort of close to the ground reading along of the Old Testament and saying, uh, 
but who's coming, starting from Genesis 3, the seed of a woman who is going to appear, uh, the Messiah who's going to come, what is God going to do to complete his covenant with Israel, to carry out the promise and to bring the kingdom? What will God do in the future when this comes about? I, I like to picture myself with the Old Testament believers, reading the scriptures, looking for the Messiah, searching them, thinking about what is this thing God is going to carry out when the anointed one comes, when the prophet who is greater than Moses comes, when the ultimate Davidic king takes his seat on the throne of David. Who is that person going to be? And you can just imagine the Old Covenant believers um, looking at the different scripture texts and saying, okay, so he's going to rule and restore the kingdom to Israel, and all of this is going to take place. He'll be on the throne of David over the nations. The glory of the Lord will be poured out over the earth. The nations will stream up to Jerusalem and learn of the one true God. And then somehow, I'm not sure how this works out, he's also going to suffer and be rejected and die. And maybe that's two different people. Like there's the king who's coming, and then maybe there's the Messiah who's coming, and maybe there's the suffering servant. You can't fault Old Covenant believers for looking at the Bible text and, and figuring that out. Uh, and not figuring that out, I'm sorry. Least of all, it seems to me, can you fault them for reading all of these prophecies and reading all these promises, clinging to them, waiting to see who the Messiah was going to be, how God was going to deliver his people. You can't fault them for not thinking, you know, these promises are so big. What God has in store for us is so unusual, so difficult to interpret. Um, it seems to me that the only way God can pull this off is if he shows up in person. You know, if he somehow not only tabernacles among his people, uh, as he did with Moses, uh, but comes as a greater than Moses and reveals himself fully and lives among us in a deeper way than we ever imagined. Um, I don't think anyone sitting there waiting for the Messiah expected for Yahweh to be his own Messiah. I don't think anyone could have been expected to think that the covenant would be completed when God, who had always said, I will be your God and you will be my people, completed his own covenant by saying, fine, you're not going to be my people? I'll be my people myself. Right? I will become incarnate. I will send my son, God in the flesh. Now only when you buy that do you begin to say, therefore, God must be both God the Father and God the Son. And unless he turned into God the Son on the first Christmas day, then he must always have been that. And if that's true, then I'm going to go reread the Old Testament and see if I missed any clues along the way. Um, it's a real mistake, I think, to go to the Old Testament and say, well, since I know the Trinity is true, everybody must have always known that. So let me see if Abraham points it out, right? Or let me see where this shows up throughout the whole Old Testament. No. Nobody knew God had a son until God revealed that God had a son and that the son was God. It's what it means to be a biblicist and be committed to a revealed religion that we don't sort of intuit or figure out by common sense or philosophize about. We know there's one God, and when he shows up as the Son of God, then we know that the one God must have existed in an eternal fellowship of Father and Son. Unless he changed. Unless Christmas is not just an important time where the Incarnation takes place, but is actually a massive change in God where he splits into two persons. If God has always been who he is, then he's always been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, only when you take that bite uh, and make that commitment to reading the full counsel of the Word of God and coming to grips with all the things that Jesus does, and, and this will be part of my, my uh, affirmative statement later on, once you take in all of that evidence and read the Bible with both eyes open and say, yes, it's true that Jesus Christ is a man and is the Messiah and is the Son of David and fulfills all of these human expected things. The evidence also stacks up over here to say he is also doing things only God can do and carrying out God's plan as God. Only once you've done that do you have the evidence on both sides. I will admit we've talked a little bit before about areas, surprising areas of agreement that we're going to have. <laughs> Um, they'll be very limited, right? I mean, when I, when I read uh, Professor Buzzard's resume and writings, I thought, oh, this is the anti-me. I'm finally going to meet me. What will happen if we shake hands? Will be an explosion? What will happen? <laughs> Where we have surprising areas of, uh, of agreement are, just as it's possible to read the Bible with one eye closed and miss the divinity of Christ, it's possible to read the Bible with the other eye closed and miss the humanity of Christ. And if you're in a good Bible-believing church with pious people, um, you every now and then run into someone who... You say to them, well, of course, uh, Jesus is human, right? And they say, well, yeah, human, quote-unquote. Now, they're not just rank heretics who deny the humanity of Christ, but they can't picture it. They can't imagine it. Because they're so sure of the divinity of Christ 
They've got the other eye closed. Can't see the whole counsel of the Word of God. This is what the doctrine of the Trinity is. It's the Christian church's one right answer to the question, who is God? Who is God? If you take in the full counsel of the Word of God, read the Bible with both eyes open, come to grips with the massiveness of what occurred in the revelation of God in Jesus Christ, run it back through the whole counsel of Scripture and say, who is God? The Christian answer is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, as always, we're kind of leaving the Holy Spirit aside because there's so much to talk about in the Trinity. The poor Holy Spirit always gets left out, um, but he can fend for himself, and he's really just there to point you to Jesus Christ anyway. So if you're talking about Jesus, the Holy Spirit is quite pleased. Um, but just too much to talk about in the Trinity. I think if you sort the Father-Son relationship out, you've really solved it in principle. Um, so the Christian answer to the question, who is God? That answer is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Unless God massively changed at the Incarnation, there must have always been this fellowship going on. Why did it take so long for this to come up? Um, why is it not until 325 at the Council of Nicaea that a bunch of people finally get together and vote on this and say, oh, I get it, that's what the Bible means. Um, I, I'll go ahead and introduce this. Yeah, I know it's, it's in your writings. It wasn't part of your affirmative statement yet. Um, I think the answer to why that question finally comes up, not why it took so long, but why it comes up at all, is because uh, the gospel spread into the Greco-Roman world. Right? It spread not to the east, into the Asian countries, not to the south, into Africa, not to the north, to the whatever those pre-Germans were who were doing barbaric things at that time. Um, it spread into the Greco-Roman world, because that's where the roads were good. Right? What, part of what it means for Christ to come in the fullness of time is, once the infrastructure was good enough, uh, that there were roads that the gospel could spread rapidly. It goes into the, the country formed by Greek thought. Now, what does that mean, Greek thought? Um, I get to teach a lot of Greek philosophy uh, on a regular basis, and to just really bottom line kind of what's going on with Greek thought, because it sounds like a bugaboo, right? Ooh. The Bible really says uh, only the Father is God, but then if you put a veil of Greek thought over it, suddenly you have the Trinity. I don't know how that happened. Well, here's what happened. Greeks, let's go with Socrates as king of the Greek philosophers. Socrates is this annoying guy you would invite to parties, and you would say, Socrates, would you uh, like a glass of water? And he would say, well, that depends. What is water? It's the big question. It's his only trick, really. It's the what is question. And so there was the ad a while ago, you know, uh, what, you want to have a hamburger and put steak sauce on it? Why are you putting steak sauce on it? Well, my friends, what is hamburger? Is it chopped ham? It's chopped, it's chopped steak, isn't it? Put steak sauce on it. Socrates' whole trick, the what is question. So you want water? Well, what is water? What is the isness of water? What is the thing that water is? What is it? Don't beat around the bush. I want to know the essence of the thing. This is the whole Greek mentality. So the point is, Everyone's going along, being a Christian, um, speaking biblical language, and then things get Greek enough that someone asks the question, well, my friends, what is Jesus? What is the isness of Jesus? What is the being that Jesus has? And the first answer, given Greek categories, is not God. That's the isness of Jesus, not God. Because there's one high God, because we all read Plato, and there's this one God. Um, and everyone believes that for a while, and it becomes a crisis. A council is called. Constantine kind of throws everyone in a room and says, I don't care what your answer is, just come out with one church. What does come out, actually, is the opposite answer to the question. What is Jesus? The Christian church faced the facts in the year 325, with the help of some Greek thinkers, said, all right, that's, you know, it's not a question the Bible exactly raises, but it's the right interpretation. And if you're going to ask the question, what is God? There's only one right answer. Or, I'm sorry, what is Jesus? There's only one right answer. We know who Jesus is. What is he? He's God and he's man. That's the essence. That's the isness of Jesus Christ. Pick up the New International Dictionary of the New Testament Theology, which is edited by Colin Brown, whom I've quoted, and I'll quote again. To be called Son of God in the Bible means you're not God. He's a systematic theologian of Fuller, very distinguished. He's the general editor of that massive volumes. I read the following, the Trinity. The New Testament does not contain the developed doctrine of the Trinity. The Bible lacks the express declaration that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are of equal essence, and therefore, in an equal sense, God himself. 
and the other express declaration is also lacking that God is God thus and only thus I use Father, Son and Holy Spirit these two express declarations which go beyond the witness of the Bible are the twofold content of the church doctrine of the Trinity oh my goodness that sounds like a Unitarian statement absolutely straight out so what's happening now this is the most sophisticated biblical work you could find practically on earth and any Unitarian will say, well, that's what we've always said. Uh, we're dealing with some very powerful people in the Unitarian world. Sir Isaac Newton would have loved to have been here tonight, because it doesn't make him right at all. You can quote names until the cows come home. But Sir Isaac Newton and John Locke and John Milton, presumably some of the brightest brains of the 17th century, were vigorous non-Trinitarians. Vigorous. That was embarrassing for them because they were politically connected. In the case of John Milton, his works were lost for 200 years and found again in the houses, House of Commons. It turned out he was an absolute heretic. He was an Arian. He, didn't, he denied the Trinity. And if you want to read his, his Father, Son, and Holy Spirit book, one cannot dismiss people like John Milton as idiots. They were very clever with words and very intelligent with words. Uh, John Locke was very sympathetic to Socinian, and I, I do thank uh, Professor Sanders for mentioning that word Socinian because. What you're hearing from me is a straight Socinian Christology, a name that comes from the Socini, the Italian brothers, uh, actually not brothers, but a, a, an uncle and a nephew, who rebelled against the orthodox uh, Trinitarian view in the 1600s. So John Locke then, Isaac Newton and John Milton were very concerned that the Trinity makes no sense from a language point of view. It was simply incomprehensible. There's just simply no way that one can be turned into three. One can say Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, the Father is God, but unless one defines what one means more precisely, one really isn't saying anything. If you just say that means one God, three cannot be one, that's clear. And Trinitarians understand that. I'm not satisfied though with their attempt to deal with that problem. I'm asked to believe by Trinitarians that God is one what? in three who's. I don't find that in scripture. I find God being one who. Singular pronouns in the Old Testament speak of a who, not a what. God is not an essence in scripture. And so my major point would be, not mine, but the Unitarian tradition, which is now many, many years old, of course, my main point would be that you really got to to, to reinvent language, or at least to go outside biblical language to describe this trinity. Why do I have to believe in an essence to describe God? Why do I have to talk of essence at all? The Bible doesn't. The word usia in Greek is not anywhere used in scripture of God. Why do I have to use the word hypostasis, persons, when that is not used of Father, Son and Holy Spirit in the scripture? Why do I have to believe that the word today I have begotten you really means in eternity I have begotten you? And how indeed can you be begotten in eternity? The idea seems to be incomprehensible. To be begotten means to bring into existence, to give existence to something that doesn't exist already. You can't be eternally begotten. The word eternal is outside of time. And so the whole notion of Trinitarian language, that is when you unpack it and try to explain it, becomes very, very complex. I really uh, am most impressed with uh, Professor Sanders' uh, artistic skills. They're simply wonderful. You, you must get a copy of his, his attempt to do the Trinity for Children. It's really quite a splendid thing. But when he gets to the section about explaining the meaning of these words, I wonder if children will understand it. You see if you can. It's very complex. So, our, our general construction then, uh, in the Unitarian camp is that we don't need the Trinity to explain the Bible. We can say all those wonderful things that you want to say, and I'll say them now. Jesus is the exact expression of the Father. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. It doesn't mean he is the Father, of course. It doesn't mean that he is God. He doesn't go around saying, I am God. He never said that. He actually argued he wasn't God. When he was accused of being God, he very quickly puts that argument to rest and says, I'm not God, in John 10, following the statement that I and the Father are one, incidentally one in the neuter sense, not one person, 
and that wasn't suggested, of course, but uh, just one. He immediately says that the judges were also called God. Those verses are sometimes omitted. His explanation is that since judges, human judges in the Old Testament could be called God, then is it unreasonable that he who was virginally conceived and dispatched into the world as God's commissioner, God's agent, is it unreasonable, he says, that he could call, be called, that he could call himself the Son of God. That's what Jesus says he is, the Son of God. Now I remind you of Colin Brown's statement, to be called Son of God in the Bible means you're not God. Israel was called Son of God. Nobody thought that Israel was God. The judges were called Sons of God. And they did take the title God, that's true. But Jesus is explaining there that that term God can be used in a secondary sense. So you must be careful when you read scripture that you don't just hear it as an American in the 20th century. When you say God, you probably mean the supreme being. Are you so sure that the Bible always means that when it uses the word God? For example, Moses was said to be God to Pharaoh, Elohim, Theos. Clearly Moses wasn't God. And there are some other examples. Now here's a very interesting fact, just a broad, basic language fact about scripture. If you take, if you look up the word God in the Bible thousands of times, Otheos, Elohim, thousands and thousands of times, in no case can a Trinitarian show that that word means God in three persons, in no single case. You can examine every single example of the word God. Can you produce one of them where clearly the word means God as a triune God, God in three persons? That seems to me to be, to be extraordinary, because if that triune God is not mentioned under the term God, well perhaps he's not there. I cannot imagine a Bible revealing who God is and failing on every single occasion, thousands and thousands of times, actually to give us the word God with the meaning triune God. So that's a weakness. Now when I do come to those passages which are critically creedal, they define the difference between God and Jesus. Like John 17, 3, you Father are the only true God and we must believe in you. We want people to believe for salvation in you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent, I clearly see a, a, a difference, a distinction between God and Jesus. And the book is about God and Jesus, not about God and God, God and Jesus. So Howard Marshall, a very famous uh, uh, commentator, says that the Christology of the New Testament is always subordinationist. I can't quite read the time of this dark, I'm sorry, four minutes. He says that the Christology of the New Testament is always subordinationist. God is always superior to Jesus. He's the head of Jesus. Jesus is the son of God. So all sons are younger than their fathers. Again, I have to make an extraordinary language leap to believe that a son is the same age, as eternal as the father. That's extraordinary. I already mentioned the word beget, which means to bring into existence. You've really got to satisfy yourself that eternal begetting is a genuine biblical idea in order to get the Trinity started because without that there really is no Trinity. And I'm rather impressed then and I do recommend that if, if you're taking this study seriously in the months ahead, you really should get the book by Millard Erickson who is evangelicalism's splendid proponent of, of Trinitarianism. He really works at it very hard and very thoroughly. And he says in that, in that book that he doesn't believe in the eternal generation of the Son. He can't find that there. And he believes in the Trinity still, so he believes in three pre-existent somethings, but it isn't the Son that's generated, apparently. He's given up that argument. That's a considerable move in the direction of Unitarian theology, in fact. I should remind you then that people like Adam Clark, the Methodist expositor, said, I find this idea of an eternal generation of the Son very dangerous and anti-scriptural. Because to generate means to bring into existence. And if you're going to talk about generation of the Son, you are immediately giving up the Trinity because it means that one has been brought into existence who was not, brought, was not in existence before that time. So these are major arguments that have to be confronted. Now another point is this, that if you read the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, you certainly could not mount much of an argument, if any, for the Trinity in Matthew, Mark and Luke. 
I've already suggested you can't mount any argument from the Old Testament. And many scholars would agree with that, by the way. And I, 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 I sense from, the, from uh, Dr. Sanders' remarks earlier that perhaps he doesn't base the Trinity on the Old Testament at all. He talked about a revision in the New Testament. But uh, if you look at the synoptics, you'll find that Gabriel is quite precise in this issue of the Son of God. In Luke 1.35, he says to Mary, Holy Spirit will come over you, Mariam, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. And for that reason precisely, your Son will be the Son of God. Did you hear that? For that reason precisely, consequent upon this miraculous event in the womb of Mary, that's why he's the Son of God. That's what is miracle about Jesus. That's why we could speak of his divinity, if you like. The fact that he's been miraculously conceived, that's what Gabriel said. And I, I would put it to you that Gabriel was not a Trinitarian. He knew nothing about the pre-existing Son. Dr. Sanders, in our, in our discussion before we began, was so right when he said, this is really an argument about the nature of the Son. We're all agreed that the Father is God. No disagreement on that. But we're going to get, as we move into, into the rest of our debate, we're going to be talking more, obviously, about the nature of the Son. I'm suggesting to you then that the Son comes into existence in the womb of his mother. Luke one thirty five, and the parallel text, Matthew one twenty. I'll finish with this. Joseph is told, that which is begotten in her is from the Holy Spirit. That is which is brought into existence. There's no pre-existing Son here. And most scholars would agree with that. So you could take that into your... In, in, into the data that you feed into the arguments as you make up your mind about the Trinity or the non-Trinity. Let me start with the claim that the New Testament does not contain the doctrine of the Trinity. The New Testament, Professor Buzzard says, does not contain the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, let me back off one step on that. The New Testament does not contain the word Trinity. Okay, that's a nice debating point. We can have a really short debate. Actually, we can just take 30 hours, read the entire New Testament, and then look up and say, you're right, the word Trinity is not in there. Right? That would be very easy. Um, question, though, does it contain the doctrine of the Trinity? That's a little bit different. Um, you'll notice, as I argue, I don't ever go to one killer magic bullet proof text that I think establishes once and for all, knock down for all time, the doctrine of the Trinity. Because there's nothing that anyone can cite that's going to say to you, because the word isn't there, right? There's no one verse that's going to say, absolutely, this is the doctrine of the Trinity. That's because the Trinity is a doctrine about God. It's a doctrine. You have to think in order to construct it. Um, so I would say all of the materials for Trinitarian theology are right there in Scripture, unavoidable. It's already there, just add thought. Okay. So here's the question. It's, it's, I'm going to be Socrates here, right? Well, what is a doctrine? What is in the Bible? What would it mean for the doctrine of the Trinity to be in the New Testament? I'd like to freely admit, no, there's not a verse which says it. Now, there are verses that, if you're going to be anti-Trinitarian, are just going to drive you nuts, right? You get to the end of Matthew, and it says, Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not the names of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you hit that, and you say, okay, that doesn't lay out, that's not the magic verse that says, there is one God, and the Father is God, and the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods. There's no verse that says that. But there's that hard verse at the end of Matthew, and then there's all this stuff all over John. It's kind of popping out all over. It's driving me crazy. Um, so I do want to concede that the doctrine, if by doctrine you mean an explicitly formulated uh, systematic statement that brings together all relevant evidence, in that sense, the doctrine of the Trinity is not in the New Testament. Nevertheless, the doctrine of the Trinity is the correct interpretation of the full evidence of the New Testament. In fact, the pressure of the entire biblical witness pushes you inexorably, if you're going to confess Jesus Christ rightly, to confess the doctrine of the Trinity as the Christian understanding of God. Now, before I go on to another point, I want to um, interact a little bit with the authorities um, that you cited. First of all, it's interesting um, that Professor Buzzard is citing authorities, because I would sort of look at this debate and say, okay, pretty much all the authorities are on my side. Sort of all the Christians get together and say, we're Trinitarian. And then you can sort of look around and say, oh yeah, well, um, 
Milton and Locke and Newton. Right, they're not Trinitarian. Uh, so their status as Christians is kind of questionable. Like Milton is just an Arian. Locke and, it's interesting, Locke and Newton being non-Trinitarians, because uh, what you're getting there is the emergence of modern science and rationalism in the Enlightenment period. And so it's no surprise that some of the greatest minds start peeling off because they're more committed to reason than to scripture. They say, I don't know anything about God except he's got to fit my rationalist categories. So then I'm going to read the Bible, and you do a Thomas Jefferson, which is something like uh, produce a version of the Bible where you eliminate all the difficult text and just have sort of the life and times of Jesus the Messiah who taught nice ethical principles which we will follow. So sort of an expurgated Bible would be a great option at that point. Um, as for some of the other evidences, Brown, especially, systematic theologian, and uh, Howard Marshall, great New Testament scholar, and um, Millard Erickson, another systematic theologian. It's interesting that you cite them as tending to, oh, I want to get your language right here. You cite these three evangelical Christian Trinitarian scholars as making arguments that sound Unitarian to you. But of course, they all go on and in print on the record repeatedly are committed to the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, and in fact, if their names start showing up as Unitarians, they're going to start making noise right away. Um, I want to say something else about Erickson a little bit later, but uh, just to point out, I, I find it odd to be arguing about authority because I kind of look at that and say, well, that's not an interesting debate. If we just ask all Christians to vote on the Trinity, I win the vote. And that's not an interesting debate because we massively outnumber those who have rejected the doctrine of the Trinity and really moved themselves um, beyond the pale of Christian orthodoxy. One of the reasons that this is just massively to my advantage, if you sort of go at this from a tradition or authority or history or wake up all the dead Christians and have them vote, have a democracy of the dead, sort of <laughs> get everyone to say what they say about the Trinity. Um, one of the reasons it's massively to my advantage is I can tell you, if you ask me, well, what should I read to know more about the doctrine of the Trinity? I can actually say to you, you know what? Read just about anything. You know, go read, did the Pope write a book about this? Read that. I disagree with a whole lot of what the Pope has to say, but I'll bet he and I have the same Trinitarian theology because we're Christians. Um, you know, you can read, uh, Bob Morey's ministry is here selling a book about the Trinity. I probably disagree with a million things that Bob Morey would teach, but I'll bet his doctrine of the Trinity is about the same as mine, because it's the Christian view of God. Professor Buzzard is in the position of having to say, well, if you want the real scoop on the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, you could buy my book. That would have the right stuff. And then I can also indicate this uh, Unitarian Socinian thread. Uh, it's, a, it's a thin trickle, but it's there in the history of doctrine. It goes back to the Radical Reformation. Uh, before that, you can kind of look around and find hints of it. But I do think that the broad, well, I don't think, it's just a fact that the broad mainstream of the Christian tradition is resolutely Trinitarian. Now, I'm going to move on to, um, I'm going to put off eternal begetting for a minute and then move on to this statement that one can't be made to be three. This is Thomas Jefferson. I type in Jefferson anti-Trinitarian or something on the web and you get these great, horrible quotations from Thomas Jefferson about you know, how, first of all, he beats up Calvin for a while, but then he says, you know, I just can't believe the doctrine of the Trinity, all of that complex mathematical stuff about one being three and three being one. Okay, that's just, it's not even a cheap shot. It's sort of a, uh, what is it? To accuse the doctrine of the Trinity of asserting that one is three and three is one is sort of crazy. You would expect all Trinitarians to not be able to balance their checkbooks, right? Because they try to add one and three and they get two. No, wait a minute. Let me try that again. They add them again and they get six. You know, ah, well, I just sacrificed my ability to do math when I affirmed the doctrine of the Trinity. Here's what a real conflict of reason would be. And I hope when you hear me bad enough rationalism and say, someone who just lets rationalist, hardcore rationalist categories run their theology and then trims the Bible to fit it, I hope you don't hear me up, uh, hear me up here saying, oh yeah, reason is evil, it's of the devil, and getting a lobotomy helps you be a Christian. Right? Obviously, a big fan of reason. I like for things to make sense. I like to understand what I believe. Uh, in fact, I think faith is a great spur to that, that faith seeks understanding. If you believe something and love it, you will examine it mentally. You will love God with your mind. So, if I have a set of beliefs which include a flat logical contradiction, if I believe something that just cannot be true, is utterly irrational, I have to get rid of it or sort of keep it on a shelf and say, I, those are words that I keep around and I say, but I don't 
know what they mean, so I can't really even explain them. For instance, if I believed in square circles, right? I'd say, yeah, well, here are the things I believe in. Uh, I believe this and that and the other thing, and I believe in square circles. They're simultaneously square and yet a circle. Wait, I'm thinking? Yeah, I'm believing it. I'm not understanding it, but I'm believing it that somehow a circle is a square. What would the doctrine of the Trinity be if it were a flat contradiction of reason? Uh, well, it would be a contradiction of the law of uh, non-contradiction, which is something like, it's from Aristotle, it's A can't be A and not A at the same time in the same sense. That's pretty basic. Um, now, the doctrine of the Trinity would violate that if it said, God is simultaneously one person and three persons. At the same time and in the same sense, God is one person and three persons. That's just irrational. That can't make any sense. Or if the doctrine of the Trinity said, God is simultaneously one being and yet three beings. That doesn't make sense. No Trinitarian has ever claimed that. What the doctrine of the Trinity teaches is, the one God is three persons. The three persons are the one God. God is one being three persons. Now, that might be a mystery. It's a, it certainly is a mystery in the sense that I can't point to anyone around here who is one being and three persons, right? God is a trinity, like you. I just can't do that. I don't know anyone who is one being and three persons except for God, right? God I know. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one being. Um, so it's a mystery in the sense that there's nothing to compare to it. For instance, I've never seen three books that I would describe as one book in the same sense. Right? You could get a trilogy bound in one volume, blah, blah, blah. That's not what we're talking about with the Trinity. We're talking about three persons really sharing the same being, being the same God. Um, so the charge that Trinitarianism teaches that one is three and three is one, is, it's just a non-starter. Um, no, we teach that God is three A's and one B. If that you can just swap out terms all you want, yeah. Uh, but it's not a flat contradiction. Now, to move on from there, um, the doctrine of the Trinity is complex, as Professor Buzzard points out. Um, and so this is another thing, kind of a Thomas Jefferson move to go, look, all I want to do is believe in Jesus the Messiah who taught me to be nice and say my prayers and don't push old ladies into traffic. I just want to believe in that. You got a problem with that? I don't want to go do this mystical mumbo-jumbo about threes being one somehow, and perichoresis, and hypostasis, and ousias, and I don't get all that. That's, I'm just a simple believer. Um, the doctrine of the Trinity is complex because it's real knowledge. Uh, and it's complex because theology is, it's kind of a, a cheeky way to say it, but the science of God, theos logos, right? Uh, knowledge, structured knowledge about God. Science, I've done some work with theology and science. Um, science is an interesting uh, endeavor in that if you get an answer right, it doesn't give you the right to stop thinking. You don't say, oh, we finally figured that out, great. Uh, now we can quit thinking about it. No, no, if you get an answer right in science, it raises more questions. Things get really interesting as soon as you get an answer right in science because more questions appear on the horizon because it's a knowledge tradition. You can actually go on and learn something. Science gets uninteresting if you get the answer wrong, right? If you just decide, oh, well, um, apples fall because they have the property of fallingness inside of them. There, that's it. Okay, no more interesting questions ever come up because you didn't even get the answer right enough to sort of ask the next question. The doctrine of the Trinity is like that. Jesus comes to you and you say, who are you? And he says, well, I'm Jesus, the Son of God. And you say, what are you? And the right answer is, well, a what answer needs an essence. A what question needs an essence answer. And my essence is, I am God. That's when all the interesting questions pick up right after that. When you get that first answer right, because theology is a structured knowledge discipline, interesting questions then begin to emerge. And so it's good that the doctrine of the Trinity has complexities. It's a sign that it's real truth, that we didn't make it up. I can make up something a lot easier than that if I were going to make up a religion. Um, by way of rebuttal, I want to go straight for this question, uh, which I think Professor Buzzard and I talked about before, is saying, well, when all of this is said and done, we're going to try various things on each other, but really we flatly disagree about the pre-existence of the Son of God. Um, and, and that's where the nub of a lot of this comes down to. By pre-existence, I mean, did Jesus start to be um, when he was born? Did the person who is Jesus Christ come into existence on the first Christmas? 
First there was not a Son of God, Jesus Christ, and then there was. There he is, baby Jesus, just now popped into existence. Now, obviously, humanly speaking, the Incarnation occurred on the first Christmas. A real, amazing event happened. An unforeseen, unforeseeable event. A majestic miracle whereby God intervened in human history more directly than any of us imagined or had reason to believe he was going to. That's important. But it's not the sudden emergence into being of the Son of God. As Christians wrestled with this and dealt with it, they came up with this doctrine, this weird phrase, eternal begetting or eternal generation. That the Son of God comes from the Father and always has come from the Father. There never was a time when he was not. And yet, he's always from. If you look at John 1.1, 1, 1, classic understanding of this is, uh, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God, toward God, God Word. The Word of God was related to God in some way, and yet was God. By the way, if you want to look at a passage in Scripture that um, you have to look at and say, Does God ever mean Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Look at John 1.1. 1, 1. No, none of the occurrences of God there, the word theos, mean Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That gets that thing that I said that this is a doctrine. So it's not like you can solve it with a dictionary. You have to actually think to construct this doctrine. But if you look at, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God and was God. What does God mean there? The Word was with God. And yet the Word was God. How can you be with God and be God? How can the Word both be with God and be God? Like, I wouldn't say, I am Fred, and I am with Fred, and I am Fred. That would be strange. If I had my son, Fred, then we could say that. But then we couldn't say, then we could say my son is with Fred, but we couldn't say he is Fred, in the same sense. Right? He's a different Fred. Um, that's what's going on in John 1.1. 1, 1. What you've got there is a distinction. The word was with God, and a union. The word was God. Now, you have to believe here that word, logos, in that passage means... As 1.14 tells us, Jesus Christ, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. Um, so, John 1.1 1, 1 establishes that the Word has this God-Word relation. Somehow the Word is God and yet has this God-Word relationship. Both is identical with God and has a relationship that is specified as being toward or with God. That's the same thing that goes on when the church fathers eventually get to this idea of eternal generation. What would that mean to be eternally generated? To always have been a son. To have a father and a son who are bluntly, just to say bluntly, the same age. Or who were never without each other. There was never a time when God the Father suddenly became God the Father. Oh boy, baby boy, now I'm God the Father. God was always God the Father. Because God the Son was always with him. He was in the beginning with God and all things came into being through him. Without him, nothing came into being that came into being. Here's God. There's everything that came into being. The Word of God is not one of the things that came into being, but is on the side of God. Always has been. That's where you get this idea of eternal generation. Now, the poor church fathers hammering away at this in the Greek language in Alexandria in the 4th century. They're doing the best they can to do justice to the miracle that has been revealed in Scripture. And as Mary says to Gabriel at the Annunciation, how can this be? She doesn't say, oh, that's impossible. I reject this incarnation idea. She says, how can this be? Be it unto me according to thy word. That's the posture of faith. This is an amazing thing. How can it be? She's probably still waiting for an answer, right? Yeah, how can that be, that whole incarnation? That's amazing. Um, so, eternal generation. This really gets to a crucial distinction, which is to say, the Son of God both is... God, in essence, and is not God the Father. Right? The Father is not the Son. This is all in the much-dreaded Athanasian Creed. Uh, the Father is not the Son, and yet the Father is God, and the Son is God. Right? It's that John 1, 1 thing. There's unity, and there's distinction. That's the doctrine of the Trinity. One God, three persons. With God, and God. Unity and distinction. So I agree with Dr. Sons very much, with Jefferson's treatment is totally unfair. I'm not proposing that, of course, at all. We have to take every text seriously. But we also have to look a little bit more deeply, I think, into what's going on in a lot of current comments on these very critical issues about pre-existence. This is a debate about the nature of pre-existence. If you have a son of God that is God the Son, and 
I'm, I'm not prepared to make that switch. There's a vast difference between those two terms. But if you've got a son of God who is God the Son, clearly you have a totally different proposition on your hands than if you have a son who begins in the womb of his mother. I just want to reiterate my point that I think that Luke 135 requires that you believe the Son began to be. I would recommend you read Raymond Brown's massive account of the birth narratives. These now, calling authorities is for this purpose, that you and I are not smart enough always by ourselves. We need help from people who spend their lifetime studying the Bible. Raymond Brown's piece on the birth narratives, he keeps repeating this fact, that neither Luke nor Matthew knew anything about the Incarnation, if you read their language fairly. I think that's a very significant point, and I want to repeat what Gabriel said here. When Mary was told she would have this child, Gabriel said, I want you to understand that the reason for this child being the Son of God is the miracle in your womb. Now that would not be true if in fact that Son of God had existed from eternity. It would not be the same proposition at all. There's a direct causal relationship between the Sonship and the miracle. That's what leads the vast majority of New Testament scholars not to find any Trinitarianism in the Synoptic, because there's no pre-existent Son there. Now, I've suggested that there's no pre-existent Son in the Old Testament either. That's 75% of your Bible. Now you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, three corroborating reports of the account of the birth and the teaching and death and resurrection of Jesus. There's no Trinity there. Very few New Testament scholars would argue for a Trinity in the Synoptic Gospels. Again, Matthew 1.20. That which is begotten in her, slightly veiled in your translation by the word conceived. It doesn't say that. That which is begotten in her, the word beget now means to bring into existence what was not in existence before that time. So the eternal begetting idea is really square circle language use from my point of view. It's square circle language use. It's 2 plus 2 is 17. It, do it doesn't make any intelligible sense. And many excellent expositors have complained against that, including John MacArthur in his earlier days, who expressly said that that is not there in the Bible, eternal generation, and others. So you have to wrestle with that and see if you're prepared to accept the idea of eternal generation as an idea. When we get to John 1, we have also to be a little bit careful that we look deeply into what's said there. Are we saying in the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with God, and presumably that would mean the Father, would it not? The Son, according to Trinitarian, would have to mean the Father. So, are we saying in the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with the Father, and the Son was the Father? If, in other words, we take that first account of the word Theos there as Father, the Son was with the Father, are we prepared to switch that to mean not the Father in the next phrase? We seem to be sat there. We would have in the beginning was the Son, the Son was with the Father, and the Son was the Father. That doesn't work. What if we look to English translations of the Bible before the King James, about eight of them, and we read the following. In the beginning was the word, small letter word, not a capital. That's an editorial edition. And I'm going to propose to you that Trinitarianism has a lot invested in the translations, because that's the massively popular view. In the beginning was the small letter word, God's plan, God's utterance. Your word is the very essence of what you are, and what you think. In the beginning there was that word. That word was with God. In the Hebrew Bible you find many occurrences of the notion of your word being with you as a plan, as a decree. Now you don't use that kind of language. When was your word last with you? It makes no sense to you. But if you probe the Hebrew, the very Hebrew uh, atmosphere of John's Gospel, you'll find there it's quite possible to understand this to mean in the beginning was God's plan, it was with him, it was his decree, and it was fully expressive of him, theos, without the article, a slightly adjectival sense. It was with him, it was fully expressive of himself. Now that expressive uh, quality, intelligence of God, became a man. So Jesus then, when we, when we read the word became flesh, we didn't read there the son became flesh. There was no son until the word became flesh. And when it did become flesh, then you had Mr. Walking Wisdom. Jesus is the closest thing to God you can get in a six-foot Palestinian, a sandaled Palestinian, six-foot-tall human being. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen God. The wonder of this is, is he is a human being. The problem is that if he's not, if he begins by not being a human being, he really never is one. 
How can you be before you are? What is pre-existence all about? How can you be before you are? Are we looking in Luke and Matthew at a pre-existing person of the Trinity reducing himself to a fetus? You see, the church fathers, when they worked this, worked this out, found this very difficult. They said, in fact, let me give you the, the Trinitarian uh, teaching here, that Jesus was a man, sorry, let me get that right, that Jesus was man, but not a man. Is that your impression of the New Testament? Do you think that Jesus was only man, but not a man? The public doesn't know the ins and outs of Trinitarian theology very well, because you don't get sermons on that. But if you probe this a little deeper, it might be just easier to think that Jesus was the Son of God coming into existence as the very expression of God the Father. This then avoids all of our complex uh, talk about three persons being one being. We avoid all that. We simply say that the Father is the only true God, that's the words of Jesus himself, the only one who is truly God. Any Jew would like that. Any Muslim would find that easier. And we'll say that the Son is the very expression of the Father in human being. He is Mr. Wisdom. He's the embodiment of wisdom. The very character and plan and teaching of God is exemplified in this human person. But he begins as all human beings do, in the womb of his mother. His uniqueness then, his, the fact that he's uniquely begotten, monogenes, is that miracle that occurred in the womb of his mother. That's a sin in Christology, and that makes better sense of the Bible taken as a whole. I agree with Dr. Summers entirely, we have to take the whole thing. It, re it relieves of us of some of the terrible complexities of how three X's are, are amounting to one Y. We'll go into that in greater detail later if we have time. Well, I feel a little bit as if I've been asked to use the Bible to prove that God exists. Uh, it seems like kind of the challenge before me as I sit and think, oh, how many things can I say in the time allotted to me with a self-evident proposition? I also feel a little bit as if um, the argument goes something like, Finally, I found a verse that explicitly says God exists. You know, Hebrews says you must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And, and then there's an explanation that says, oh, well, but is, you know, that's a Greek category. Um, so what I'm going to do is go way too fast and just sort of cannonball a whole lot of what I consider to be the New Testament evidence, what I'm talking about with this reading the Bible with both eyes open, not neglecting any of the evidence. Uh, that's not the most exciting sort of setup I could possibly give you. Hey, everyone, hold on to your seats. I'm going to talk really fast and say a lot of Bible verses. Um, but instead of just waving my hands at the whole book and going, you know, it's in there, it seems to me that the responsible thing to do is to cite all the evidence I can think of uh, that counts. So, you've already noticed that my strategy um, on why I believe the doctrine of the Trinity, why I believe that Jesus is God, is not that I think there's one verse, because, again, you could just do this in 30 hours. Read the whole New Testament and ask yourself, where is the sentence, quote, Jesus is God, end quote. Or, preferably even, the sentence, Jesus said, open quotes, I am God, close quotes. That'd be the magic verse you really want. That's not the way things work, because that's not how God revealed himself in the New Testament. Um, instead, I want to kind of tell the whole story, and we've done the big picture already. We've talked about this long, slow crawl through salvation history, where the Messiah was coming, and the suffering servant was coming, the Davidic king was coming, God was going to undertake to complete his covenant and bring things to a conclusion, uh, to save his people. All of that was going to happen. How is it going to happen? And it really is amazing when the New Testament opens, you know, when you get that, just that first opening of the New Testament, where everything comes to a conclusion in Jesus Christ in ways you never could have imagined, that it's all bundled together. It would have been reasonable to expect a series of about 19 Redeemer-like figures to show up in a serial. You know? Oh, look, at there, and then, and then there's the suffering servant, and now the Davidic king showed up, and man, they just keep coming, there's so many of them. Instead, one person showed up, God the Son in the flesh, Yahweh undertaking to complete his own salvation historical work by taking on flesh and tabernacling among us. That's the big story, and it's that story that drives the whole of New Testament Christology. That is, why we believe that Jesus is God is because of the whole story of Scripture. Not because I found one verse somewhere in Philippians that makes me believe in the deity of Christ. Okay, 
the Christology of the Bible, who, the, who and what Jesus is according to the Bible. Jesus does a lot of things that only God can do. And the Son of God is referred to in other parts of the Bible as doing things and being involved in things that only God is involved in. For instance, um, the Son of God is the Creator. Uh, according to John 1.3, Colossians 1.16, Hebrews 1.2, you get uh, the Son of God being the one who creates. Uh, in the John 1.2 passage that we looked at, we have this really firm distinction drawn between God and everything which has come into being. There's this being-becoming language going on there, right? God is, and He was, the Word was in the beginning with God. And then you have all this becoming language. Then there's all this stuff that went through a process of becoming until it came into being. The Son, the Word, is on that side. And it's that same Word who takes on flesh. Um, and I, yeah, I, I just, uh, I find the reading of John 1 that says, this Word who was in the beginning and was with God and was God, uh, this one whom we beheld and who took on flesh and who became flesh and dwelt among us, to view that as sort of a personification of a plan that God had it just seems to be really abstract and bloodless compared to understanding it as actually, yeah, this person, the Word, the Logos. We call him the Son in other places. And he became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten. Um, so the Son of God is the creator. He's the sustainer of the universe, keeps things in motion. Uh, the Son of God is the one who gives life. Uh, John 1, 4, again, that the Logos is the one who um, all things came into being through him, and uh, this life was the light of men. Um, is the ruler of all things, uh, Matthew 28, 18. Now, in relation to human beings, and this is where we kind of turn to the incarnate, the ministry of Jesus Christ on earth, and you do get into the synoptic theology. In the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you have Jesus walking around doing amazing things, healing the sick, uh, Teaching with authority, this is really important. You know, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, he, Jesus talks for three chapters in red print, if you read King James Bible with red print. Uh, this Sermon on the Mount was my first favorite passage of Scripture, because I was flipping through the New Testament, I hit three chapters of red, and thought, well, that's got to be the important stuff, right? So, um, Jesus teaches the Sermon on the Mount, and then the crowd is astonished. Why? Because this guy teaches with authority, and not like the scribes and Pharisees. Now, you could just look at that as saying, oh, well, he had a lot of stage presence, right? I mean, he taught with authority. He didn't kind of hem and haw and talk in scholarly footnotes and stuff. Uh, but he really knew what he believed and said it. Now, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is doing some really cocky things there when he teaches with authority. He says, hey, you might have heard that it was said by them of old time. Who are them of old time? Moses. Right? Moses is fairly important. Now, who's got the right to stand on a hilltop and say, yeah, Moses said this, but let me tell you something. Here's the real deal. You'd better be bigger than Moses to do that. Who's bigger than Moses? Well, God's bigger than Moses. Um, if Yahweh undertakes to reinstate his law and really set... I mean, his law, you know, the law by which God interacts with his people. Um, if the God of the covenant is going to show up and define and elaborate and apply the law by which he expresses his righteous standards to his people, that's really something. And no wonder the crowd sort of put down their lunches and said, that guy teaches with authority. He just laid Moses out and set him straight. That's authority. He forgives sins. You know, there are these really interesting passages in the Synoptic Gospels where Jesus is saying, um, you know, they bring the, the sick person to him and he says, your sins are forgiven you. And they say, hey, only God can forgive sins. And he says, okay, what's better, healing someone or forgiving sins? Look, I'm tired of talking to you. Get up and walk. You know, there's sort of this, yeah, I can forgive sins, I can heal people, whatever. Um, he's doing things that really only God can do. Um, and I don't just mean it's a miracle so only God can do it. I mean, who can forgive sins? Right? David says in Psalm 51, against you only I have sinned. Sin is directed straight at God. Now, if you know what David's confessing in Psalm 51, you realize that there's a pretty long list of people he sinned against, right? Uh, Uriah, certainly, Bathsheba, his own commanders, and the entire people of Israel. He sinned all over the place and wounded and offended entire nations. But what he says to God is, against you only I have sinned. Because sin is a slap in the face of God. It's rebellion. It's doing the opposite of what reflects the character of God. So who can forgive sins? Well, Jesus is standing in the gospel saying, your sins are forgiven you. 
Jesus goes through the Gospels, um, granting salvation and imparting eternal life. And then in Acts 4.12 and in Romans 10.12, um, uh, the apostles tell us that that is in fact what Jesus Christ does. Jesus gives the Spirit, you know, Matthew 3.11, uh, John the Baptist is baptizing Jesus in the Jordan. And there's this whole interesting argument there about, so you're here to be baptized. Now, why would I baptize you? Because, as, as John the Baptist says elsewhere, you... You came after, you're coming after me, but you're before me. You're greater than me. That's, that's odd. Um, as John the Baptist baptizes him, he's saying, uh, the one who's coming after me is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So Jesus is the one who gives the Spirit, who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Uh, then, of course, Acts 2.17, Pentecost, where, in fact, the risen Lord gives the Holy Spirit. Now, who has authority to give the Holy Spirit of God to human beings. Classic Trinitarian theology, the Christian answer is, well, the person who, as God, took on flesh and established really a beachhead in our humanity, really sort of, you can picture God saying, I want to give you my Holy Spirit humanity, but you can't handle it. I've never met the man who can handle the Holy Spirit of God. You know? um, for God to dwell in the heart and in the life and being of a sinful person, that will burn them up. So you know what I'm going to do? I am going to take on flesh and receive the Holy Spirit in his fullness and then impart it to my brothers of the assumed nature that I've taken on, the human nature of Christ. He raises the dead, obviously. Um, he exercises judgment. This is crucial, especially for the sorts of um, kingdom, the, you know, Jesus' big message, the coming of the kingdom of God um, and the judgment of the last day, this uh, judgment that's going to come. And for Jesus to walk around saying, all judgment has been handed to me by the Father. You know how God is supposed to judge everybody? Psalm 98, the Lord is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the peoples with equity. Well, you know what? Instead of the Lord, Yahweh, doing that, he handed it all over to me. I'm doing it now. I'm in charge. So if you need judging, come see me. Um, divine status, moving out of the events, the things that Jesus does. Uh, although, let me say one other thing there about exercising judgment. No, let me not say that. I'll move on. Divine status claimed by Jesus or accorded to Jesus. Um, oh, gee, the second person of the Trinity, uh, the Son of God, is accorded uh, divine attributes. He's a possessor of divine attributes. John 1, 4, 10, 30, 21, 17. Blah, blah, blah. I'm going fast here. Um, he always was. That's something that only God does. He always was. Uh, John 1, 1. John 8, 58. Before Abraham was, I am. Uh, other passages in John. Philippians 2 6. Have this, Paul's just doing an ethical exhortation. He's saying, hey guys, be like me. Be like uh, uh, yeah, Apophras. Um, you know, be, be like you've seen. And have the same mind in you which was in Jesus Christ. Who, by the way, though he was in very nature God, didn't grasp onto equality with God, but made himself nothing and took on the form of a servant. Um, he is equal in dignity with God. Uh, the, the, really, the best place to look for this is Revelation. And uh, I'm going to get to Revelation here in a minute. He perfectly reveals God. That's an amazing thing to say, right? Moses didn't perfectly reveal God. And Moses chatted familiarly with God, and yet was not allowed to see anything but the passing by of his glory. Jesus shows up and perfectly reveals God. He is the embodiment of truth, as he says, I am the truth. That's pretty blunt. He is the joint possessor with God of the kingdom. Ephesians 5, 5, Revelation 11, 15. Let me say something really quickly about the kingdom. In the Synoptic Gospels, um, Jesus' message, obviously, is the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. Um, the kingdom of God. This is the message of Jesus, right? And it's really valuable to look and see uh, the sermons that Jesus preached and the message that he was driving and what he came to tell the house of Israel. The kingdom is coming. Now, suddenly in John, very little talk of the kingdom and a whole lot of I am statements. I am this. I am that. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am, I am, I am. Does Jesus go from being a sort of God-centered, kingdom-focused guy in the synoptics to suddenly being self-obsessed in the Gospel of John? Does it suddenly quit being about the kingdom of God and start being about him? What's going on when John reports the things he does, all those I am statements, and does not report very many kingdom statements? It seems to me that what's going on is John is restating the same theology. The four Gospels share the same theology. John states it differently. Instead of um, quoting all of the things Jesus ever said about the kingdom, he quotes all of the things Jesus ever said about himself, because if you take all the Gospels together, you see, oh yeah, Jesus' message of the coming kingdom, 
It was all wrapped up in him. He wasn't just a neutral prophet who showed up and said, Hey, God sent me with a message. The kingdom is coming. Now watch for it. Here it comes. No, he came and said, God sent me with a message. The kingdom of God is coming, and it is intimately involved with me, with my person, with who I am, with the authority that I have to carry out the very work of God in human history. It really is all about Jesus Christ and who he is. So if you switch over to, what sermons did he preach? What did he teach? Oh, he talked about the kingdom. Well, let's us talk about the kingdom and leave his person and his claims out of it. Um, he is... This is a, this is a, a kind of a wild paraphrase to bracket all four Gospels together and bring out a point. Jesus is the kingdom. Either that or John wrote a lousy Gospel and left out Jesus' main message. He didn't leave out Jesus' message of the kingdom. He translated and he quoted the things that Jesus said, which revealed that all that kingdom emphasis was really focused in the person, the being of Jesus Christ. Now, in relation to humans... Um, Jesus receives the praise of humans, um, and this shows up less in the Synoptic Gospels and more in, for instance, Matthew and the letters where people praise Jesus Christ. Um, he receives prayer, people pray to him, we pray to him, uh, and have biblical warrant for doing so. First Christian martyr, Stephen, looks into the heavens and says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He is the object of saving faith. You have faith in Jesus Christ, and he saves you. Um, he is the object of worship. In fact, he is the object in Philippians 2 of the worship of all things. Every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He receives all worship. Um, he gives blessings. Uh, Paul pronounces these benedictions and says, God bless you and Jesus bless you. Uh, he is the object of doxologies. And then there's a fascinating range of passages. I can't do this because it's a bad thing. Just, I wish I had like a chart or a blackboard or something. There's a lot of these really great passages in the Old Testament that say Yahweh. The day of Yahweh is coming. Prepare the way of Yahweh. They've got the divine name, the tetragrammaton, the name, the revealed covenant name of God. And then in the New Testament, they're quoted and applied to Jesus, right? So the day of the Lord is coming. Or the best is uh, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, in Joel 2. And then Paul in Romans 10 says... Yeah, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, because whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Joel says, whoever calls on the name of Yahweh will be saved. Paul says, confess Jesus Christ, because whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus certainly is Lord. There's no question about that. He is the Lord. The only question is, is he the Lord God or the Lord Messiah? How would we answer that question? We would go to the most, uh, the most obvious passages where Jesus asks this question, Who do you say that I am? And I, I would mention in passing, he didn't say, What do you say that I am? Nowhere does the Bible say that God is a what. It says that he's a person, a single person, thousands and thousands of times via the singular pronoun. That's a remarkable fact. So the question of Jesus is very Hebrew, not what do you say that I am? It's so much of this extra biblical language that has to be fed into the system, I think, to get this Trinity thing going. But who do you say that I am? Well, what was the answer to that? What is the, the rock on which the church is founded? You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Those things are equal in meaning. Messiah is Son of God. Psalm 2. There's no difference, essentially, between the son, Messiah and the Son of God. And in the New Testament, consistently, you are to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the criterion of salvation. That's the criterion of authenticity. To believe that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. No mention there at all about God the Son. This language has become so familiar to us through liturgy and so on, that we don't question it, perhaps. But it's worth asking the question, where are we getting this God the Son language from? Certainly not from Scripture. So we don't have any word for God, which means the triune God. We don't have any word equivalent to God the Son. We don't have any word which tells us that the word beget can mean other than to bring into existence. Nor do we have any indication in Scripture that the word today, today I have begotten you, means in eternity I have begotten you. So we're stuck then with a great deal of biblical language in contrast to later than biblical language under the influence of Greek philosophy. It seems to me that uh, the problem is simply this. 
when you move beyond the New Testament period, you're entering, as Dr. San Professor Sanders said, the Greek world. And you're beginning to describe these great truths about God and the Son of God in a completely different language, a foreign language. You have to be very careful with that. If you introduce a whole lot of vocabulary into the discussion, which isn't there in Scripture, you may wind up talking about something that isn't scriptural. It's an obvious danger. Those of you reading Maurice Wiles, uh, Professor Sanders and Isaac have mentioned him with approval. At the end of his book on archetypal heresies, he gives a very strong caution. He says it's extremely dangerous to discuss Christology and who God is in terms of Greek philosophy and Greek philosophical terms that are not biblical. There's an enormous danger there. You might wind up talking about God in Greek terms rather than Hebrew terms. That could be dangerous. As far then as the sonship of Jesus is concerned, and that's the whole, the whole crux of this debate, I don't think that you have to be God to do all those wonderful things that Jesus did. What if God decides that he'll do all those wonderful things through his human, divinely uh, generated son? You don't have to be God to forgive sins. If God authorizes you to forgive sins as a human being, the text in Matthew 12 says that the public, who are often extremely wise, wiser than the Pharisees, wiser than the theology police, the public discerned and marveled at the fact that God had given such great authority to a man. They didn't think that God had given such great authority to a second person of a divine uh, triune God. The beauty of this whole picture is that this is a human being who can sympathize with you, who is who's tempted in all points as you are, which becomes extremely difficult since if he's God, because God cannot be tempted, as we know. There are certain things that God cannot do, he cannot die. And so the extraordinarily complex arguments that developed in post-biblical times about how Jesus could be God and how Jesus could die are worth examining. Supposing we make it simple, Jesus isn't God. God cannot die. Jesus died. That should be obvious. It isn't true that Jesus' body died, but he himself didn't. That becomes very dualistic and complex. You introduce a principle of division all over the place, which isn't there in the text. It might simply be easier to say with Jesus that the Father is the only one who is truly God. And he himself is the Messiah. What then if we look at the word Lord carefully? I appreciate very much the fact that Professor Sanders points out the evident truth that there are Yahweh texts in the Old Testament which are applied to Jesus in the New. Does that mean that he is Yahweh? Now wait a minute. There are 7,000 occurrences of the word Yahweh in the Old Testament, always with a singular verb. I thought we learned in English grammar that singular, and Hebrew grammar, because it works the same thing, same way, that singular pronouns and singular verbs indicate that the person is one individual. Yahweh is always singular. It never has a plural verb. Thousands of times. Seven thousand times. Those Jews, you know, learning the scriptures with the same zeal and excitement that is, that is demonstrated by Professor Sanders, those Jews were impressed with this fact that they should never, ever stray from the notion that God is a single, undivided individual. An undifferentiated individual. And they learned it because he kept saying, I, and was referred to as me, or him, and so on. So that fact being, I think, self-evident, that the Hebrew Bible is a Unitarian piece, and by the way, most, many, many Trinitarian theologians working out of the New Testament would fully admit that the Hebrew Bible doesn't have any hint of any kind of Trinity, and some of the standard arguments are being abandoned all over the place, arguments that came out of the Catholic Church, incidentally, where, for instance, Elohim was supposed to be a plural, let us make man. Just pick up your NIV study Bible and see that those arguments have been abandoned. So they're not proofs of anything. So you still have to reckon, I think, with the fact that this son is not Yahweh himself. Certainly he can do things that Yahweh is said to do. For example, the second coming of Jesus in the New Testament. In the Old Testament it's called the second coming of God. It's God who comes in power, not the second coming of God, but the coming of God in power and glory to destroy his enemies at the day of the Lord is said to be done by God. But what if Jesus does it as the representative of Yahweh? In what sense then is he Lord? Well, it's always good in considering such matters to look at the verse which is a favorite refrigerator uh, proof text verse 
in the New Testament, which verse, speaking of the Lordship of Jesus, do the apostles use consistently throughout the range of the New Testament writings? And the answer would be Psalm 110 verse 1. Psalm 110 verse 1 says that Yahweh, the Lord, speaks to my Lord. Here you have God speaking to somebody other than God. Yahweh, a single person, speaking to another single person. But who is that second Lord? That's a very important verse, not only because it's alluded to or cited some 23 times in the New Testament, but because it is a very plain statement about the relationship of that second Lord to the first Lord. I'm very interested in that. You've got two Lords there, but only one of them is Yahweh. Yahweh speaks to Adani. You may have to consult the rabbi or read your Hebrew text, but look carefully at that word to describe the Messiah. You know, Jesus quoted that verse in the Synoptics. It's quoted in a discussion with the Pharisees, and both Pharisees and Jesus agreed that it was indeed the Messiah that was being spoken of there in advance of his coming. This is the divine oracle of David in Psalm 110 verse 1. The Lord speaks by oracle to my Lord. Well, who is this my Lord now? If that word there were Adonai, which is the word in Hebrew for the Lord God, I would concede at least a binity if not a trinity. But you know, it isn't the word Adonai. And the amazing thing is that numerous authorities have miscited this, misquoted the fact of the language here. I've written to, even to Dallas Theological Seminary where inadvertently they told us that that second word there is Adonai. I wrote to the Lockman Foundation who do the New American Standard Version and when this verse is quoted by Peter in a critically important passage in Acts 2 where Peter explains to the people that God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ, and he quotes, guess what, Psalm 110 verse 1, and the Lockman Foundation in their margin said, well, the word here is Adonai. It isn't. That's a remarkable, a remarkable fact. It's very unusual, and I'm not suggesting this is done deliberately in any way, it's very unusual for standard printed authorities to actually misstate the Hebrew word. Very unusual. But the fact remains that there's a sort of extraordinary, not, not a conspiracy deliberately, but a, shall I suggest there's a, a certain carelessness here with the language. If in Psalm 110.1 it said Yahweh speaks to Adonai, you'd have Yahweh speaking to the Lord God. Adonai is the word in the Hebrew Bible 449 times, which refers to God. When you hear Jews praying, they don't use the word Yahweh, as you know, they don't use the divine name. But they speak of God as Adonai, Adonai, Adonai. You can remember this, it rhymes with El Shaddai, everybody knows that song. Now in that Psalm 110.1, it in fact says, the Lord says to Adonai, my Lord. Now Adonai occurs 195 times in the Hebrew Bible. In every single occurrence, it refers to somebody who isn't God. It sounds awfully like Colin Brown here. At Fuller Seminary telling us that to be son of God in the Bible means you are not God. Here we have God, Yahweh, speaking to Adonai. Adonai, check it with your computers, and you'll find out it invariably means a superior, a Lord, who is not God. Carefully distinguished by those meticulous Masoretes, Masoretes, carefully distinguishing God from man, because those Jews did not want to confuse God and man. And so in that marvelous psalm, you have an extraordinary oracle in which that second person, Messiah, my Lord, should be spelt M-I-M-Y, small m, and small l-o-r-d, as it is in some careful translations like the R-V, the Revised Version, R-S-V, and so on. You simply have to check that with a rabbi. But what I, what I propose is simply this that Jesus, on the basis of, the, of that psalm, is not the Lord God, Adonai, but simply my Lord, the Messiah. That term is used of David, for instance. You talk to the king as my Lord. We Brits know that because in the House of Lords they address each other as Lord so-and-so. So my Lord is the highest form of title addressed to a superior, but it certainly doesn't mean you are God. So that psalm, I think, should be taken very seriously as a master Christological text, governing, in fact, the atmosphere of the entirety of the New Testament, where none of those Jews imagined that the Messiah was God himself. They didn't need to imagine that. They'd learned that God was one. 
So all of those incredible things that Jesus, not incredible, those wonderful things that Jesus did, like healing the sick, miraculous powers, what is happening there is that God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He's made this marvelous creation in the womb of Mary, invested that person with the fullness of spirit. So what Jesus says is perfectly a reflection of what God thinks and says. But he's still the man, Messiah Jesus, in contrast to the one God of Israel. That would seem to make much better sense of the text taken as a whole, the picture as a whole. I was going to point out also that in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, I put a small w on there, uh, I would say all things were made through it. Now I'm not twisting the Greek here, it's entirely ambiguous in Greek, it depends what you've decided the word means. If you think it's in the beginning was the Son, then clearly you're going to have all, the, all things were made through him. But if you read those eight translations in English before the King James, they read, all things were made through it, and without it, nothing was made that was made. At Qumran, the Jews say that kind of thing. This is extra biblical stuff, not in the Bible, but it reflects on the Bible. There's a nice saying then, in Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls, God made everything through wisdom. Without wisdom, he made nothing. Everything that was made was made through his wisdom, his divine plan, his conception, his mental conception. So I don't find any difficulty at all with John 1.1. It does not say, in the beginning was God the Son. That simply is a later development, and a much later development. Then uh, the authority of Jesus then is invested in him as the supreme plenipotentiary of the Father. That seems to me quite clear. And John is saying that over and over again. But when confronted with the idea that Jesus himself is God, he denies that flatly. When accused of making himself equal with God, or on a power with God, he immediately says, I can do nothing by myself. Well, what kind of deep, potentiating, almighty God is that? I can do nothing by myself. I can only do what the Father tells me to do. It's extraordinary, as Barrett in his commentary on John says, is Jesus really saying, I am God, and as God I do what I'm told. That's extraordinary. There's no need for that. We don't need the Trinitarian explanation to deal with the facts, I think, quite adequately and in a way which harmonizes the broad message of the text from the beginning of Genesis right to, through to Revelation. I hadn't heard that line from C.K. Barrett, I am God and as God I do as I am told. I actually like that. I understand you would say that's not necessary. I think, hey, there's some good Trinitarianism. That's a real understanding of who God the Son is and why the Father is not the Son and why they're always in fellowship. Okay, um, let me start with um, the question of biblical language and unbiblical language. We started to scare out enough Bible verses here, and sort of, um, while we both admit there's no magic bullet that's going to uh, send the other person home crying because it turned out they hadn't read the Bible closely and there was a plain verse that refuted their position utterly. You have to be really, you wouldn't even have to be a bad scholar. You just have to be dumb to sort of have a biblical position and go, Oh, yeah, I hadn't read Zechariah, had doggone it. Well, I can't have that idea anymore. We're just, neither of us are going to find a verse that will do that. It's sort of this intractable, intractable problem. If we could be here all night, um, we could really scare out all of these verses, and we could diagram them, and we could go back and forth, and I could say, What? That sounds crazy. Give me your interpretation of that again. I can't even wrap my mind around that. That is, in fact, exactly what happened at the Council of Nicaea when a whole bunch of church fathers and bishops got together and argued about this. The, um, the orthodox side would roll out an argument and say, well, look, John 1, 1, Trinity, don't you think? And uh, the Arians would say, no, no, we can find a way to explain that. See, logos there means sort of God's big idea. And when it becomes flesh, it doesn't mean an incarnation takes place. It means that when the human Messiah showed up, he really represented God's big idea. That's our explanation. Or, actually, Arians wouldn't have done that. Sorry. Um, Arians would have said, he's like a super angel, he's Hercules, and he showed up and he had God's big idea. Um, so they go round and round about these Bible passages, and they just don't get anywhere. And finally, someone has the big idea of saying, okay, we have argued Bible verses till we are blue in the face. I got an idea. What if we pick a word that's not in the Bible that specifies what we mean by all the Bible verses we're quoting? 
What if we just come up with one? In their case, in their particular argument, they came up with this word homoousios, of one essence. Listen, all this stuff about Jesus, is he the Word, is he, is he the Lord Messiah as opposed to the Lord God, and trying to keep all that straight and how we read the Bible? Answer me this, is he homoousios with the Father? Is he of the same essence of the Father? Is he a different thing than God the Father? That question finally drove the Arians nuts. They could have stayed there all day quoting Bible at each other, because as long as they quote Bible, they're allowed to believe whatever they want, as long as they're all saying Bible verses. But as soon as someone steps up and says, nope, here's a word, it's not in the Bible, but it'll nail down what you mean by the Bible. Now, both sides do this, frankly. Um, to say that Trinitarianism uses unbiblical language is just to say that this is a theology that's trying to be precise and tell you exactly what it means by how it interprets the Bible. Unitarianism does the same thing. You've used uh, the clearest phrases that, that uh, Professor Buzzard has used in his descriptions are these phrases. The Bible says that God is a single person thousands of times. A single, undivided, undifferentiated individual. Right? Now that's crystal clear. I know exactly what he means when he says that. All ambiguity goes away. The things where I'm not sure where our disagreement is. Everything's crystal clear when he says a single person, a single, undivided, undifferentiated individual. That's clear, but it's not biblical. That phrase is nowhere. The Bible certainly does not say thousands of times he is a single person. It uses a pronoun. Well, what does that mean? Ah, to specify what it means, you've got to use unbiblical terminology, because the whole fight is over the meaning of the Bible. Uh, there, was a, there was a Christian theologian early on, second century, a guy named Irenaeus in, in France, actually, in Lyon, um, who said, he was arguing with a different group, a kind of a crazy group called Gnostics. Uh, he was saying, you know what these Gnostics are doing? They're taking the biblical message. They didn't have verses back in the second century, but bear with me on this. It's as if they're taking every verse of the Bible, and they've got them all, but they got them all mixed up and interpreted crazy. You know what it's like? It's like there was a beautiful picture, a mosaic, of a king. And everyone could go and look at this mosaic and all the precious jewels that go to make up the face of this king. And everyone could say, what a beautiful picture that is. The heretics have come along with their chisels, dug every jewel out, rearranged them to make a picture of a dog, and glued them back into place. Right? All the right stuff is there. The interpretive grid is just totally wrong. That's what's at stake, and that's why people go to non-biblical language. That's why both sides go to non-biblical language to specify what they mean by the biblical language. Um, it keeps you from running around and around in circles. It's interesting, during the Reformation, someone came to Geneva and tried to get Calvin to sign the Nicene Creed. and. Um, you know, Calvin's kind of a cocky guy. He doesn't take kindly to someone coming to Geneva and telling him, you've got to sign this. So first he sort of said, yeah, it's more of a song than a creed, don't you think? And, I don't know. and then he said, you know, I don't care about the word trinity. I don't even care about the terminology person or essence. Um, but I do know that when I fight with non-Trinitarians, who are kind of coming out of the woodwork during the Reformation, sort of, hey, let's get rid of the Pope. Let's get rid of transubstantiation. Let's get rid of the trinity. Oh, wait. How far are we going to go with this? And that's where the radical reformation argument comes from, right? People who decided, yeah, let's get totally radical and throw out everything that ever came along anywhere in the Christian tradition. Um, Calvin actually looked at it and said, I don't care a bit about these terms, trinity, you know, person, essence. But I do know that as soon as I pronounce the word trinity, all the Socinians just hit the doors. You know, that we can argue about Bible words all we want. But I can just say this word and blow away a whole haze. That's what it's for. Um, and it's actually it's kind of a, a comparison for what it's worth. Looking at the Bible and saying, where is the doctrine of the Trinity or the word Trinity is kind of like looking at nature and saying, where is gravity? Show me gravity. I want to see it. All I see is apples falling to the ground and bouncing. I want to see gravity. Show me where I can put my finger on it. And the scientists kind of hem and haw and say, well, you can't. It's not that we're embarrassed here. So that's kind of an obtuse question to say, where can I show you gravity? The apple's falling to the ground, that is gravity. But I suppose if you want to just keep being skeptical and saying, no, nah, I don't see it, all I see is the apple's falling. Until you can show me the object called gravity, I'm not going to believe in it. That's kind of what it's like to look through the Bible and say, until I see the doctrine of the Trinity stated, until I see the word Trinity in print, I'm not going to believe it. All I see is Jesus being the Lord and sitting on the throne of God and bringing judgment. But I don't see this Jesus is God anywhere. Um, I want to say one, yeah, let me say one quick thing about eternal generation. This is a complex discussion. Um, Miller Erickson, I just have to speak up briefly in his behalf. Um, when he says he doesn't believe in eternal generation, and I actually haven't chased down John MacArthur's position on this, his earlier position. Um, 
when someone like that says they don't believe in eternal generation, it's this complex distinction that you sort of don't, it's sort of advanced topics in Trinitarianism, because you're dealing with Trinitarians here, who then say this odd thing, I don't believe in eternal generation. Well, what is eternal generation? There's two big ways to think about it. One is, it's a state. The Son always exists in a relationship of fromness from the Father. In book four of Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis, Lewis uses an illustration of this. He says, imagine two books, I wish I had two books with me. Imagine two books stacked on top of each other. And the top book owes its position to the bottom book, right? It wouldn't be up here if the other book weren't under it. So it sort of depends on the bottom book for its position. But now imagine that they were always there, that you had never stacked them. You'd say, yeah, that top book is dependent on the bottom book, but there was never a time when it wasn't dependent on the bottom book for what it is. So eternal generation, Lewis is saying, without using any technical terms, because C.S. Lewis is a genius at using little baby easy words to communicate profound Christian truth. Uh, I, I hope to grow up someday and talk that simply. Right? For now, I just have to use big words because I'm not smart enough to use little words. What he's saying then, he's taking the position that eternal generation is a relationship. Now the other option is to say, well, eternal generation is a process, but it's an eternal process. So we start with the analogy of something coming forth and coming into being, but then we say, but it's eternal. So to put this really bluntly, and this is not my position, but I'm trying to be fair to this, posi to this Trinitarian position. Sort of like if you could go to heaven and look at God, you would see the Son always flowing forth from the Father. Like if you could behold the dynamics of the divine life, you would see the Son always in a process of, of streaming forth from the Father, like light from the Son, like beams of light always coming forth from the Father and always being in the process of coming forth. Now, you can tell that if you've got a kind of a poetic sensibility, you'd really like that, right? Ooh, the eternal process of the Son streaming forth from the Father. Calvin didn't have that kind of bone in his body, so he just said, I don't like that kind of stuff. Right? Let me go for this relation. The Son was always from the Father. The Son always has this relationship with the Father. Okay, that's advanced topics in Trinitarianism, right? People who are Trinitarians and who agree about all that stuff that say, what do we mean by eternal generation? Occasionally, those people are sloppy and will say in public, I do not believe in eternal generation. Generally, I know this is the case with Miller Erickson. Generally, what they mean is, I don't hold to that sort of eternal process view, because I don't know what that means, and it's kind of weird something. I said too much about that, but maybe you can tell this Doctrine of the Trinity is one of my favorite subjects. Even, even the um, pools and eddies within the vast doctrine of the being of God are exciting to me. Okay. Um, I want to wrap this up then with... Oh, no, you know, i got to do one more thing about advanced topics in Trinitarianism. It's um, because Professor Buzzard cited um, the Fifth Ecumenical Council, not the first, and I see in 325, which we're talking about, but the Fifth in 553. This is a much later council where this, uh, this phrase that Professor Buzzard cited, Jesus is man but not a man, right? I just have to say, that's one of those things that if you have already accepted the biblical mandate to affirm the deity of Christ and then you start thinking through the obvious question, well then how could he, being God, become man? How could this thing occur? Then you're involved in a knowledge tradition. You have to sort that out and you have to be consistent because we don't have any irrational faith. At that point, what you get to is that fifth council eventually, which it's not fair to say in English, he's man but not a man. Jesus Christ is a man uh, and is a, an incarnate person. He is a person. There's this, I mean, I'd have to lay this all out on a chart, but it's sort of this an hypostatic, an hypostatic Christology where um, basically what the fifth council affirms is there was no Mr. Jesus running around who the Son of God then came down from heaven and hijacked and said, I am now possessing you and taking you over and kicking out one person and being a different person. There never was a Mr. Jesus who suddenly turned into God. That's what the fifth council says. All right. I'm the only one interested in that whole discussion. So. Let me say this. One of the consistent strands that I hear in Professor Buzzard's uh, entire approach is a concern for monotheism, for the uh, oneness of God, for, for the godness of God, and the fact that God is a jealous God, and he doesn't give his glory to another. Um, Isaiah is just full of this stuff, you know? There is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none except me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. I am God, there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness, and will not turn back. To me, every knee will bow. Every tongue will swear allegiance. They will say of me, only in the Lord are righteousness and strength. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another. 
That is the concern of the Bible, the unity of God, that jealous, I will not give my glory to another, oneness of God. The problem with the view of Jesus Christ presented by Socinianism or Arianism is that it takes all of God's glory, all of his prerogatives, his being as the one to whom every knee will bow and every tongue confess, takes all of that and gives it to Jesus Christ. It takes the man Jesus Christ and puts him on the throne of God in the driver's seat of all reality as the consummator of the covenant and God's ways with the world, hands it all over to a man. And at that point, when Muslims look at Christianity and misunderstand it, they look at Christianity and think it's sort of Socinian, and they say, you just handed all the glory of God to a man, a mere man. You're an associator. You've associated someone with God. I submit that the only way out of that is if God doesn't give his glory to another, because the Son is not an other, not another being, not something else, but is God, God the Son. I heard that uh, Jesus was the creator of heaven and earth. I, I think if we take the Bible and look and see what is said about who created the heavens and earth, I think you'll find it was God. And the word God in Scripture in the New Testament 1,320 times refers to the Father. When Roman Catholic scholars like Rana sit down and do a patient study of what is meant by the word God in the New Testament, in Greek, Theos, I'm using the modern Greek pronunciation, they say that it means invariably the Father. There are two occasions only, for sure, in which the word God is applied to Jesus in some sense. The very imbalance of that evidence would suggest to me that they're not equally God. That's extraordinary. I've already mentioned to you that the word God, in, if you count up the Hebrew word uh, Elohim, multiple thousands of times, it refers to a single person. Uh, I have to say that if you have a pronoun it seems to me a pronoun does describe an undifferentiated person. I grant that the word undifferentiated doesn't occur in Scripture, but the pronouns I, ani, and so on in Hebrew do. And I think we have to think, what does a, what does a singular pronoun mean? Since everybody agrees, Trinitarians apparently, and non-Trinitarians, that none of those occurrences of the word God gives you a threefold God, then it seems to me to be a massively important point that God is described as a single person so often. Now I heard then that Jesus is the creator. I don't think he was the creator. Hebrews 4.4 4 says that God rested. The word God in Hebrews means the Father, as it does almost invariably in the New Testament. So it was God who rested on the seventh day. It wasn't Jesus. The passage in Colossians is difficult because it speaks of everything being made in Christ and through him and for him. It doesn't say that everything was made by Christ. I would certainly recommend you look at James Dunn, who is, I'm quoting authorities here, but we're all quoting authorities, either ourselves or someone else. Look at James Dunn and see if you find anything of interest in what he does with those passages. He says that we must not read Paul through our Trinitarian spectacles. And that he's not there saying that Jesus is the creator of heaven and earth. He's saying rather that God made everything with Jesus in mind. In Jesus, everything was created. Well, you were also in Christ before the foundation of the world. At least we should attempt to put this kind of a uh, hypothesis on our studies and say, let's think like Jews now. We know that Jews think in terms of plans and projects, everything in advance. Let's think that way for a moment. Everything was made by God in Jesus. You were also in Jesus before the foundation of the world as a Christian. He's talking there not about the creation of the bees and the trees and the grass. He's talking about intelligent beings, uh, angelic authorities. He's simply saying that Jesus is the firstborn of this whole creation. There are many excellent scholars who say that when Jesus is said to be the first of the creation, that's exactly what it means. He's the first created being. Many, many of the standard Bible dictionaries admit this. Again, I, I, I see the danger of just quoting authorities. My point has been here that you've got a mass of very significant authorities who undermine the Trinitarian argument at almost every point. That's got to be significant. I think that the Trinity is on the way out. I think that scholarship is now so sophisticated, so attuned to the Hebrew melodies of the Bible, that it's beginning to cause the Trinitarian case to become weaker. I think that's interesting if you're investing in, investigating these things. 
Just as a parenthesis, in my own case, when this Sicilian Christology was put to me, I gave myself at least two years to even consider it. I objected at every point. I can remember thinking, I've got 50 verses which say that Jesus pre-existed his birth. Let me give you an example of one. The rock that followed them was Christ. Well, then he must have been there. But upon reflection, reading the context carefully, and I, again, I recommend James Dunn's monumental study, the Christology in the Making book, he doesn't say Christ, that the rock, was a human being walking around. And Paul in that very passage says, Paul is speaking typically. Well, of course. He also says they were baptized in the Red Sea as a type. Yes, indeed, that rock was a type of Christ. It wasn't Christ actually there. So I wish, uh, in Trinitarians tend to assume that God the Son is a given. I don't see that at all. I have first to establish that. They seem to assume that Colossians 1.16 is talking about Jesus being the creator of heaven and earth. When we get to Philippians 2, I read it this way. Let this mind be in you. Now let's take some alternatives. Is Paul there saying to you, imagine what it's like to be an eternal, uncreated being in heaven and one day decide to be humble enough to become a man. Does it make a lot of sense to you? Or is he rather saying, as even Luther says, another authority, and many other good exegetes say, there's nothing to do with pre-existence there at all. He says, look at the man, Messiah Jesus. He calls him Messiah Jesus there, Christ Jesus. Elsewhere he calls him the man, Messiah Jesus. Let's suppose for a moment that Paul didn't believe in the pre-existence of Jesus, literally. He says, look at the example of the historical Jesus, who being a, a, a serious mistranslation in the NIV, by the way, the nearly inspired version, be careful with this Christological, because there's a huge bias. It doesn't say, being in very nature God. Oh no, being in the form of God. You're going to have to look at that very carefully and weigh the possibilities. But being in the form of God, in the image of God, reflecting God, being so much like God that he can say, if you've seen me, you've seen God. Being in that condition, he didn't use that power, that extraordinary divine power, for his own advantage. As king, he could have commanded the world, he could have killed everybody off who resisted him. But rather than use that extraordinary prerogative, because Jesus is not just a man, he's an absolutely uniquely generated man, he didn't use that power for his own, that equality of God, which he did have. He did have an equality with God, of course. He is on a power with God, in the sense that he's reflecting God as a human being. He didn't use that power to his own advantage, but he washed the dishes. He humbled himself. Now that's more of a lesson for you. You watch that Messiah walk through Galilee there and copy that. But you don't need to copy some uncreated being who existed from forever and decided to become a man. That's extraordinary. That sounds more like Greek mythology where gods become men. That's not, I think, what Paul is getting at. So in view of the fact that he was so humble and set that example of humility, then God exalted him to the highest point short of being God the Father, to the glory of God the Father. He's exalted certainly to the position of Lord Messiah, we know that. And I went through at some length the point about Psalm 110, indicating that he's the human superior, the Lord Messiah. That's what Luke 2.11 says, the shepherds were told, today is born in Bethlehem the Lord Messiah, not the Lord God, the Lord Messiah. He's also the Lord's Messiah in Luke 2.26. He's Yahweh's Messiah. Yahweh's unique son. That makes pretty good sense. And so um, the fact, for instance, that he was worshipped proves absolutely nothing in terms of him being God. You're going to have to look at the language here. The Greek word proskineo is used of David in the Septuagint. It's used of many authorities. You can worship an authority. In England you call the mayor his worship. You can worship the mayor. It doesn't mean the mayor is God. It's totally misleading to think that when Jesus is worshipped, he's being worshipped as God. That's simply not true. There's another Greek word, latrevo, which is used only of worship of the Father. But these link language points have to be investigated carefully to see if, you, if, if there might be a distinction there. So simply to say that Jesus is worshipped doesn't make him God, I think. Uh, the other thing is that he does miracles. Of course, because God empowers him to do these miracles, as he did with the apostles in the book of Acts. Paul is clearly not God, because he can have his shadow, or Peter, his shadow passing over people. So those I don't find, find convincing arguments. And I'll admit to a very simple, a simplistic, I think Dr. Sanders will probably feel, approach to this. I don't feel the need for this, what I, I, I think is a rather romantic 
theological view. We've got to construct the Trinity because that really is doing justice to the complexity of Scripture. I don't see that complexity there. I find very satisfying the idea that God still remains a single person and as Son of God, Jesus is perfectly adequate to the task. And he seems much more real to me. And the Bible comes alive to me in an extraordinary way when I see this extraordinary human being and the marvelous thing that God has done with a man. And as for the arguments about him being man and not a man, I can only refer to those many scholars who were taught that very thing in theological college. They were taught that they had to believe that Jesus was man, generic man, but not a man. R.P.C. Hansen, you should read carefully, he says, when I was taught that in the theological college, I later gave it up as hopeless. It doesn't make any sense at all. Jesus is clearly a man and not just man. So I don't think that those things can be dismissed quite so easily. Also the fact that, for instance, one of the church fathers, uh, Clement of Alexandria, felt that Jesus didn't need, really need to eat. That Jesus has become very non-human. He became very much unlike a human person. A final point I want to make is that there was a development towards the Trinity. It's a complete mistake to say that the Trinity just arrived suddenly out of the sky. It isn't there in the early church fathers. Tertullian, who is the father, for instance, of Latin Christology, of Latin theology, Tertullian says there was a time when the Father was not Father and there was no Son. There was no Son. That doesn't sound like the Trinity to me. And Justin Martyr says that God begat a Son before the creation, brought him into existence, arithmetically another God, his second God, but very much subordinate to the big God. He wasn't suggesting that that Son was equal with the Father. And so, one of the fine things that scholars have done recently in R.P.C. Hansen, Hansen's book on the development of Christology is just fascinating, because he says we have, to, we have to rethink what we've been taught in this area. We've been taught that Arius was some rogue who came up with a brand new idea that the Trinity wasn't right. That's not, not true, so says uh, Professor Hansen. What actually happened was that nobody knew exactly how divine Jesus was. They were still arguing all that. And Arius really represented the earlier view. Athanasius is the innovator, says Professor Hansen. He's the guy who comes along with the brand new ideas. So there's no way that you can trace that trinity back into the New Testament in history from 325 behind it. It doesn't work. And I think that theology I and mean, uh, uh, the, the history of patristic studies is rather sophisticated now. I can only recommend you read these experts like Maurice Wiles, R.P.C. Hansen, and evaluate the evidence. And see if you can really trace that trinity all the way back faithfully to the New Testament. I don't think it can be done. So that tends to strengthen my position then that the good old unitary monotheism of the Bible was really intact until it got spoiled, as I see it, at uh, Chalcedon and uh, Nicaea. I'd just like to comment on some of the very fascinating drawings that, that uh, Professor Sanders has here in, in his comics for children, which is really an interesting exercise in trying to make the Trinity clear to children. Uh, Professor Sanders earlier said that it, it's quite wrong to say that Trinitarians believe that three X's are one X, and he's of course absolutely right. We should never ever say that. Nobody's going to imagine that one X can be three X's. So in saying that there are three persons in one God, one must distinguish between the persons and the one God. They can't be equal. The problem is that most Trinitarians don't, don't say that. What they say is, each one is God and that's one God. So they come over as a parody saying that, that three X's are one X, which is illogical and contradictory. But if we probe further and do justice to the Trinitarian cause, then we've got to, to, to recognize the distinction between the persons and the being. All right, so we say then, if you hang Hanegraaff, the Bible answer man, that God is three who's in one what. But it's rather alarming for me then to go to Alistair McGrath, the Oxford Trinitarian who writes with a passion on the Trinity, and he says, no, that's not right at all. God is one person in three what's. You've got the difference, right? Hank Hanegraaff and, and, and other presentations of the Trinity, you've got three who's in one what. But Alistair McGrath has got one who in three what's. Well, if this is so self-evident, why is such 
extraordinary disagreement in the Trinitarian camp. Because, because Professor McGrath, presumably, is very learned, he knows his stuff very well. And he's not able then to agree at all that there are three who's in one what. So he insists that God is a single person with three roles. Really. That's the very opposite then of what Hank Hanegraaff is telling us, that God is one what in three who's. Well, in a very interesting way, Dr. Sanders tackles that issue. Uh, just in parenthesis, uh, Erickson is extremely uh, gentle in his approach here. He's almost conceding that this is illogical whichever way you do it. He quotes a logician, Stephen Davis, as saying that nobody in the Trinitarian camp has been able to achieve a coherent explanation of this, of this issue of how three can be one. Nobody, he says. It hasn't been done. He says it may be done in the future, but so far uh, it hasn't been done. And that leaves us as Sicilians very puzzled. You'd think there should be some explanation of how this Trinity trin thing really works, logically. So then what we learn from uh, Professor Sanders' pictures, and, and they're just brilliant, you should, you should look at these, they're, they're most entertaining. We have the notion that you cannot love a what, and yet you are to love God. It seems illogical to me. We're told that Jesus is a who and a what. He's both a who and a what, and the Father is a who and a what. So you apparently have then two or three who what's in one who what as it seems, or, although maybe the last one is a what. Uh, I don't, I, maybe I haven't studied this in detail, I, need to, I have actually in some detail tried to study it, but I would be surprised if a child would come away with a clear idea of what this is about. So my bottom line again then is simply that the biblical God is never triune, he's always a who, he's always a person. The Hebrews simply don't think in terms of essences. God is a person, he's very active very involved and interacting with humanity, but he's not an essence. I don't see that at all. And if I can't find a single text which says that God is an essence, I'm perturbed by the notion that I have to believe this to be saved. Because I have to remind you, this Trinitarian thing has been very tough. I'm just delighted, of course, with Dr. Sanders' gentle approach, it's just, and I expected that entirely. I wasn't expecting anything other than that. But it hasn't always been so. They get awfully hard on you if you don't subscribe to the Trinity. You're kicked out of every church in the past, and to some extent even now. Is there no way that we can dialogue with each other in a better way? Would be my final point here. There surely has got to be a better way than saying you can't be saved you, unless you believe in this three who's and one what. I don't believe people even know what that is. Well, if they don't know what the doctrine is, how can they say they really believe it? If you don't preach on it and teach it, how can it be that it is the one doctrine that you must believe to be saved, according to so many evangelical pastors? It all seems to me very odd and very strange. Either you teach the thing and make it clear, then people say, I believe it, and I'm going to be saved by believing it. Or you say, it really doesn't count. It isn't there at all. And I don't think most churchgoers even know what this doctrine is. Much less can they explain it when even Dr. Sanders, with all of his brilliance here, leaves me certainly very puzzled as to about, as to about how this uh, three in one thing works. So that's the negative side of it. The positive side is, and I simply repeat, that Jesus constantly uh, refers to the Father as God. The Bible constantly does this. Jesus, I think, makes a unitary statement over and over again. My cousin J.A.T. Robinson says that John's Gospel, John in the Gospel of John, is as undeviating a witness to unitary monotheism as any New Testament writer. So once again, there are so many huge names in theology who are undermining the Trinitarian cause. Now, you may feel this is simply an apostasy. I say it's, it's waking up to the fact that good as this Greek thing may be in its own terms, it may be admirable as a way of explaining God in Greek terminology, but it isn't the biblical way. The Hebrew Bible will not entertain this Greek philosophical language. By all means, study them separately and admire the virtues of both. But I think it's wrong to read the Trinity back into the New Testament all the time. At worst, this could be, as Professor Luce, who lectured in Ohio in 1922, he says that the Trinity caused a veiled polytheism to enter the church. It entered the church camouflaged 
If you look at the state of the church, it's mass chaos. Paul said, I want you to have one judgment, all of you, to be perfectly united in one judgment. Denominationalism is mass chaos. Something seems to have gone wrong. Could it be that we would get back to the God of the Bible by believing, with Jesus, as I think, that he is one single person, that he and Messiah is the Son of God, totally dependent upon God. That might be a way back to unity, and that's what I would suggest as a, as a real possibility. To approach a complex doctrine and assume that you ought to be able to understand it without thinking about it, you just wouldn't approach anything else in the world that way. You wouldn't be handed a book in French and say, what the heck, I can't read this. You mean I have to go read another book, like a French grammar, before I can even read this? To expect that you can approach a serious doctrinal topic and just get all the ins and outs of it um, is frankly a little bit philistine. It's sort of it's sort of low ground. I'm not um, attributing that to you. I know that you're speaking on behalf of uh, sort of poor, benighted people out there who have been given this really awful training where they misunderstand. And someone has taught poor RPC Hansen that Jesus is how's it go, man, but not a man. Which is, I agree, utterly inconceivable. How could you? read stories about Jesus walking around in Nazareth and go, oh, that's humanity, right? <laughs> There's just, it's impossible that you actually can't conceive that. That would be a square circle. And some wicked, dumb Christian professor taught little RPC Hansen that, and RPC Hansen never got over it. And somehow, in spite of his massive erudition and the 900-page book about the 4th century Christology that he wrote, where he seems to have read everything, somehow he never got over the fact that some bad nun told him theology in a completely wrong and irresponsible way. Probably wasn't a nun, right? Um, it's philistinish in the sense that uh, my wife is a mathematician and it'd be pretty easy for me to go to her and say, what is this calculus stuff? It's like space under a curve, but it's infinite? Or it's not infinite, but it's like one infinite against another infinite and somehow that gives you this finite space? I mean, how does that even work? That is crazy talk, you know? It's just, Calculus. Right? Well, I'm an idiot. I never took calculus, right? I wouldn't expect to understand it. And if she tells me, listen, take this one on my authority. This stuff works. You know, you'd be amazed how it works. Let me show you like rocket ships and impressive things, even to math idiots like you, who can understand this stuff works. You know, so to do the kind of, it's two or three who what's and one who what uh, is, is sort of to stand on the outside, not to have made the basic fundamental decision to grapple with the evidence of the New Testament, not to agree that it says the divinity of Christ is here and must be dealt with, and then to look at the advanced topics and go, therefore those out there don't make sense. Basically, a guy who fully comprehend isn't God. And, I, and again, I don't want to use that as warrant for me to just go out and obfuscate anything I want and have the orange, not orange guy. I've got biblical evidence that points me to something where I say, I see the lines going this way, I can't see where they connect, but I wouldn't expect to be able to draw you a diagram of how God works. Um, I know a whole lot of ways he doesn't work. He can't just be the Father, he can't just be the Son. I, I want to tease out a couple of phrases, some that you've used here. You've talked about, um, Professor Bush, you've talked about Jesus as being divine in a sense, and I assume that sense is sort of the sense in which my wife's cooking is divine, right? Ooh, thanks, honey, that meal was divine. Um, but certainly not having the nature of God or, or being, in essence, God. Um, you've also talked about worshiping Christ, uh, but interestingly, you cited evidence of worshiping non-divine uh, persons. So uh, I guess my question would be, do you worship Jesus Christ and in what sense? Who else do you worship? Do you pray to Jesus Christ? And if prayer is something that can be offered to humans, what other humans do you pray to? That's kind of my question. What kind of, in a sense, divine are we talking about? Page 167 of your book, you say, For the early Christians, Jesus had the value and reality of God, but he wasn't God. But he had the value and reality of God for the early Christians. This seems to me... What I'm afraid you're doing is trying to stay radically committed to monotheism, so much so that you even remove Jesus from the definition of who God is. But then you introduce this divine in a sense and have the value and reality of God for the early Christians, and we worship them, but quote unquote worship. Um, so Sinus himself had this problem, right, where he worshiped Jesus Christ, but taught that he was not God, and then his followers said, well, if he isn't God, we're not going to worship him. And Sinus didn't like this and said, no, you got to worship him because the Bible says you do. But his followers were more consistent and said, no, we don't worship anyone but God, so we're not worshiping Jesus.
Um, you've pointed out, and I'd like to say something about if you go to hell if you don't believe in the Trinity. Um, if you manage to somehow get to heaven without believing in the Trinity, you're going to be really shocked to find out you have to hang out with the Trinity for all of eternity. Um, it's not that God has a list of things you must be able to get right on a test and say, well, he got the Trinity question wrong, so he goes to hell. No, it's more a matter of how wrong can you be about God and still be saved? Just how wrong can you be and still participate in salvation?